and we'll also dedicate some additional time for questions. Now let me first go into introducing the panelists. Um, I'll keep it very, very short. They will all tell you probably a little bit more about their background and where they come from. But first of all, we have uh, Deborah Brown from the Association uh, for Progressive Communications. We have Matthew Shears, uh, who is with GP Digital. Benedict Aris from Shadow Server. Alexander Klimburg from the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Kaya Sieglich from Microsoft, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name there. Excellent. And uh, Christine Hoopers from CERT BR, which is uh, the Brazilian CERT team. Now, what did we do this year? Initially, at the beginning of the year, we determined that we wanted this year to really focus on development. And the best way to tie into development was by looking at work that had previously been done in the Internet Governance Forum, uh, being the CENB, Connecting and Enabling the Next Billion Projects. There had been two phases of that work at that point in time. One of them focused on identifying very specific policy options that could help various stakeholders understand what policy decisions were positive or negative in actually growing the Internet and getting the next billion people online, or next billions, rather. And finally, they also did work on understanding how those policy options and the growth of the Internet can help support development or achieving of the sustainable development goals. The way that we approach that work is by having a few volunteers in the group do a detailed risk analysis of uh, CENB Phase 1 and Phase 2. And I particularly would like to thank Andrew Cormack for that, who unfortunately couldn't be here. But he was one of the experts that did a lot of that analysis and published that work back to the community as part of this PPF. We then did a focused call for contributions. Uh, we did two different ones, actually. One focused on uh, organizations that participate in the IGF and outside of that community. The second one focused on the NRIs, the national and regional IGFs, because we particularly wanted to get in expertise from these more regional communities. And we did a total of eight virtual and one in-person meeting. Uh, the in-person meeting took place at the Global Conference on Cyberspace just a few weeks ago. Moving on to the next slide, we um, also had a set of detailed email conversations, and I just wanted to highlight the richness of those conversations by showing some of the topics that we worked on. Um, we looked a bit at industry responsibilities and what duty of care means in that sense. Uh, we had a discussion around um, authorization of organizations to hack back. We identified forums that already worked on established uh, areas of work, such as Internet of Things, had a very rich discussion on cyber norms and confidence building measures. Uh, we looked at Internet shutdowns, how to define cybersecurity, and how to better engage private sector and government, which has been a challenge historically for this best practices forum. The questionnaire that we sent out asked a few very concrete questions. The first one was, how, do, how does good cybersecurity actually contribute to the growth of and trust in ICT technologies, and how does it help support sustainable development goals? We also asked about the other side of that coin. If we don't succeed at building good cybersecurity, how does that hinder all of those same goals? We also looked at the assessment that was done by Andrew and a few other volunteers to assess the CENB Phase 2 and Phase 1 policy recommendations. And we asked everyone who submitted to identify very specific policy options that help address, uh, and in particular within this multi-stakeholder environment, those cybersecurity challenges. And we also flagged that developments don't really happen in a highly coordinated way. Um, Managing Internet governance is really managing complexity because there are many stakeholders involved. They all do individual things, and they interact in unexpected and very creative ways. So as a result, we were curious where submitters saw responsibilities for each of those communities in helping ensure that cybersecurity doesn't hinder the future development of the Internet. Because if the great work that we do in security prevents new features, new technologies from actually helping people, we're doing something counterproductive. So we wanted to flag or identify where that may be the case. And then finally, uh, based on a suggestion by one of the BPF members who's also here, Wouten Altis, we asked what everyone felt was the most critical cybersecurity issue that could be addressed within the context of the IGF, or where the IGF multi-stakeholder community could make a lot of progress. And that led to some interesting discussion throughout the year. 
Now, we received a wide set of formal contributions, uh, in total actually 27, which is uh, almost, I believe, a third more than last year. So we definitely saw significantly more interest than the previous years. These slides have a, a small overview of some of the submissions that we got. One of the things that we did identify is that the amount of submissions from private sector and government were lower than expected or lower than uh, other communities such as civil society and the technical community. And that's something that we spent quite a bit of time discussing and working to identify how we can address this in future years. Then moving on, I would like to ask uh, Olusegon Olukbile, who is uh, one of the chairs of this BPF, uh, to share a little bit with us what was learned yesterday from the main session on cybersecurity, which copied many of the same topics. And I wanted to make sure that as we go into our discussion, we have some of that information here, and it can help us drive forward uh, some of the discussions. So, Shigun, over to you. Well, uh, thank you, Martins. We've been having back-to-back -back meetings since the last uh, main session on cybersecurity, and even the report is uh, still being processed. But what I'm just going to do now is just to give a brief, uh, a kind of a short, uh, 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 the, 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 the information and uh, what I have here is so short, but uh, let me see how it will add value to what we are doing here. Basically, the main section on cybersecurity uh, is entitled Empowering Global Cooperation on cybersecurity for sustainable development. And the rationale behind it is such that uh, we are looking at the process where there can be a continuation of uh, dialogue on whether cyberspace should be, you know, uh, designated as a, a space for development uh, rather than as a space for war. And uh, we are also looking at the intersection between the cyberspace and development and peace. And uh, somehow, most of our speakers came from various background, uh, uh, private sector, civil society, and uh, intergovernmental. And I have some of uh, the representative of this organization here. And um, basically, we, we, most of the speakers recognize the fact that the threats are increasing and that uh, we are ever, you know, um, getting exposed more to the issues of threat worldwide. And um, the issue were further discussed, most especially from the, uh, the government group of expert report. And uh, it was emphasized in that meeting that even though if they were unable to have um, um, a kind of consensus based on the mandate given to them by UN, that uh, uh, the, the IGF should still be a, you know, a place where such a continuation can, can um, um, where such dialogue can continue, such that uh, the modern stakeholder can provide interventions on how uh, the issues of, of cyberspace being deployed for, um, for, for the purpose of peace and development. Then we also look at the, uh, there are various recommendations and norms that were discussed yesterday, especially from Microsoft and uh, from the chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Then uh, cybersecurity uh, was discussed fully in depth, and uh, one of the key issues that we also looked at is the perspective of uh, human security how the community can enable and protect human rights, or how the issues of human rights can be balanced from the context of the cybersecurity. But one particular threat, there is one considerable threat in cybersecurity that needs urgent attention. That is the huge gap in capacity, because most of the speakers seem to have an agreement that there is a big gap in the areas of capacity to protect uh, us from such threats, and, uh, and the need for us to know, as uh, you know, to know whether as a legislator or whatever stakeholders group that you belong to, where to invest in critical resources. Then we have a submission from various uh, groups, such as SAT Martins and uh, international cybersecurity strategies, who are discussed in various um, contexts. And uh, overall. Uh, we, we also place emphasis on the fact that there's a need to increase cyber hygiene across the space. 
though there are several proposals from new instruments such uh, as uh, the digital uh, convention being proposed by the Microsoft, uh, there was little interest from the floor and panelists who largely prefer to look at how existing law applies and how better implementation of the existing law can help to address some of what we are talking about. But however, the proposal from the Microsoft actually attracted um, uh, a larger interest of the stakeholders in this section. And the Microsoft proposal is looking at how uh, the private sector can provide intervention and how government can protect private sector from the issues of cyber threat and cyber attack. Uh, then uh, finally, we had the pleasure to hear of various uh, specific programs from other countries and other organizations and what they are doing to overcome cyber threats. We had a presentation from Nigeria and they showcased a kind of um, a case study where multi stakeholders model was used to uh, drive the, the, the process of cyber security strategy development. So what I can say is that uh, what we are doing here is a continuation of how we can um, look at cyber security from the context of development rather than from the context of uh, military issues. Then the issues of attributions to we looked at it in depth, and I think there are a lot of contention issues in that area. But uh, for now, I think that is the little I have here, but the detail of the uh, report will soon be made available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shigun. Uh, typically, this session feeds into the main session. This year, the schedule is a little bit the other way around, but I think that's actually good for the benefit of the document because a lot of this information can now also be reviewed and then see if it fits into the work that we've been doing throughout the year. Uh, moving to the next slide. So this year, as I mentioned earlier, our goal has been to identify policy options that can in a way serve maybe not, even, not as recommendations but as inspiration to organizations that are trying to identify what the right thing is to do to create a good balanced cybersecurity environment that can help bring the next billions of people online safely and also um, enable us to use technology to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now, this session would be significantly too short if we were to walk through every policy proposal because if you look at the current draft document, um, it is about seven pages of, uh, of policy suggestions. Um, and a great degree of thanks goes out to our consultant, Wim de Gazelle, who has been uh, putting together that information based on the discussions that we have had in the group. However, I did want to highlight uh, each of the policy areas that were identified as worthy of investigation throughout the year. We looked at securing the reliability of and access to internet services to make sure that people actually can get online in a reliable and secure way. Mobile internet came up, in particular driven by developments in the developing world, where the mobile internet is one of the most important pieces in bringing people on, online uh, due to the lack of other infrastructure. A very important uh, subject was also how we can actually protect technologies from abuse or potential abuse by authorities. There was confidentiality and availability of sensitive information, which is a very typical information security question that came up quite a bit in the discussion. We looked at abuse and gender-based violence, and there were some interesting uh, identifications there of how this actually affects people in different economies and different countries in, in quite different ways. So that's interesting to read in, in the document. We looked at shared critical services. Uh, there's quite a bit that makes up uh, the core of how the Internet works and how that needs to be protected. ICS technologies was brought up, in particular in, uh, with regards to bringing online technologies that help uh, provision water and electricity. So we're talking about industrial control systems here. Um, one interesting one was how information is sometimes collected and then later reused for different purposes than the original collection. And what can be done to limit that level of exploitation of information that may not be um, initially expected. Deployment of secure development processes was an area of great discussion and, and debate. And then finally, how to prevent unauthorized access to devices. Interestingly enough, there were also a few areas that came up that hadn't originally been anticipated in the review of CNB phase one and phase two. And I'm listing those here as well. They're also listed in the document separately. 
The first one was all about awareness building and capacity development, so education and how do we educate users and where is the boundary between educating a user and actually making the technology secure by default was an interesting area of discussion. There was also cyber resiliency of cities as cities start more and more using Internet of Things style technologies to provide services. Uh, that was an interesting topic where uh, there was some discussion as well uh, which came up in some of these submissions. Lack of diversity in cybersecurity, and in particular the lack of participation by women was outlined as a, as a significant limitation to allowing us to actually grow cybersecurity as a discipline. Cryptocurrency was brought up. The impact of social media on cybersecurity, in some cases this was actually referred to as fake news, uh, which was considered as, a, as an issue as well. And then finally, whistleblower policies and implementation. As I mentioned earlier, we do not have enough time to go in detail on all of them. I would highly recommend that you review WIMS uh, excellent document. Um, and it is open for public comment right now. So you can review it, review the individual policy recommendations and make uh, comments on anything that you would like to see changed. With that, I would like to spend a little bit of time discussing some of these in more detail. And as I mentioned earlier, we brought a few experts with us to this group in addition to what you bring to the table. So what I'd like to do is for each of these give two experts the ability to share a little bit of their thoughts on what some things are that need to be taken into account as policy is developed to meet some of these goals and then have a wider open discussion for a few minutes on, uh, on things that are important. I would like to ask everyone to keep their contribution limited to about two minutes so that there's time to get a, a wide variety of views. The first area of, uh, of um, area of policy that, that was brought up as interesting was being uh, certain that we can provide safe and reliable access and tied to that is securing those shared critical services because those two really contribute to the fact that if a user uses the internet it is operated and runs in a reliable way. And with that, I'd like to give the word to Christine Hoopers, um, who is an expert that's actually contributed in the best practices forum since the very, very first one on the computer security incident response teams, and, uh, and ask her for her opinion on what some of the challenges are as we come up with policy recommendations in this area. Thank you, Christine, and welcome. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, I think w one of the good things also from this best practice forum to be today is that we get into a lot of discussions and I'll try to cover some of the things that were not covered yet in other sessions and I think that uh, one of the challenges for having safe reliable and and even the security of shared services because we call them shared services the core of the internet but they are actually distributed systems that are managed by different people that depend on uh, different industries that are uh, spread across different countries. So I think one of the major challenges is try to come up with what's the right incentive for all the players to adopt best practices. So if we are talking about IPv6, if we're talking about the NSSEC, we're talking about RPKI, we're talking about not meddling with uh, DNS, and how do we incentive? Because usually the one that implements the best practice is not the one that sees the benefit outright. In, in all of these practices, they are important for preventing route hijacking, preventing uh, DDoS, because actually it's just so easy to have DDoS because we have the whole internet at service of the criminals to perpetrate attacks. So I think this is one uh, policy challenge. What, what's the incentive? How to incentivize, not necessarily by policy or by market or uh, social responsibility? So it's, it's really, I think, we need to have a, a dialogue on that, and it's not really easy. Uh, one thing, for example, governments are big buyers. They could incentivize by putting really strict rules on uh, we only buy equipments that have best practices, that have security by default. We only hire providers if they implement best practices. So we are all talking about this, but we could also have some incentive that's not really uh, with a policy, but with a push for the market. Another challenge that I think is touched a little bit is uh, secure software because all is software nowadays. And I think academia needs to play a bigger role and is not, in my opinion, into researching more add-on security or more tools. But we should really try to focus more into creating better professionals. 
So most of the computer science professional engineers and programmers, they leave the university, they don't have a clue how to do secure software. If you leave a civil engineering course, you know how to do a building that will not collapse. But nowadays, the companies are getting a workforce that is clueless on how to make secure software. So we talk a lot about the role of the private sector, but the academia should also think about in inserting secure development and secure software abuse cases. So they need to think that since the very beginning and not create more security training, but create security mindset on the society. And I think this all could then have a better impact on one of the challenges that a lot of people discussed here that is the small and medium enterprises. Because they don't have the budget to have IT uh, guys, to have security systems. And I, if we could have better software and security hygiene, it would solve most of the problems. So I think it's long term. It's nothing like short term. But I think we should think about uh, how we could change uh, how we, we think about the, uh, the industry and the f creation and, and training of professionals. And, and this, it, it really involves, I think, all stakeholders and, and it's a multi-stakeholder problem to think about. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Christine. So what I'm here is very much focused on who and when can we incentivize particular organizations to build better cybersecurity? And then the second question is, how do we actually turn it into a mindset rather than just a patch that we try to apply uh, when we have the problem? Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, I'd then like to pass it along to Benedict Addis. Uh, he also has some, uh, some deep experience in the matter in his work with the Shadow Server Foundation. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Benedict Addis. I'm an ex-law uh, enforcement officer from the UK, and, and then I got better. Um, and and, um, and what, I, what I do now is work for an organization called the Shadow Server Foundation, which is a, a not-for-profit set up to uh, do some of the plumbing between CERT organizations, so day-to-day uh, -day in the trenches work of, pass of scanning the internet for bad stuff and then daily reporting that out to CERTs like Christine's to tell them where the bad stuff is. So I'm really operational, so I'm, I'm, I'm having to change up a few gears to talk to you guys. Um, I think one of the things, one of the themes that's emerged um, for me today has been the, um, the unforeseen consequences of regulation. That sounds rather boring, so let me give you, give you a few examples. Um, one of the things we see um, in my security group at ICANN, the SSAC, um, is where domestic legislation that's intended to improve cybersecurity actually ends up damaging it. So we see a problem that's either pushed away, uh, in law enforcement we call that displacement, um, or where we make a problem actually worse for ourselves. So an example might be where we talk about um, uh, countries seek to uh, localize, geolocalize. For example, Russia has passed some recent legis legislation um, seeking to localize and regulate services uh, uh, so that you have to connect to one another or store content within the physical boundaries of their country. As a result, costs go up to business. As somebody said in the previous session, if the internet's a business thing, costs go up. And so what happens? Hosting companies and transit providers and ISPs end up connecting to each other outside of Russia. So the exact intention, which was to localize services and make it harder for other countries to look at traffic, we all acknowledge this happens, actually makes it easier for other countries to look at what should have been domestic Russian traffic. This actually wasn't a problem before. Only 3% of Russian traffic went outside the country, and now it is, because ISPs respond to cost incentives. So this is on the theme of perverse incentives, if you like, and perverse incentives happen a whole bunch of times on the internet. Um, we saw, um, uh, uh, we see a similar problem, which many countries have, um, and, and my own country, U the UK, is really to blame in a huge way for this. Um, when we allow courts or uh, or governments to start blocking domain names, we think, oh well, it's it's uh, it's no harm if we just do it a little bit. Let's just do it a little bit. We we all know that that that's that that never happens. So the UK, sh shamefully in my opinion, and I'm, I'm no longer a government employee, so I'm allowed to criticize my own government, uh, <laughs> not that I didn't before, um, allowed um, the Pirate Bay and other, and other, and other uh, uh, copyright infringement of copyright infringing domain names to be blocked by civil court. As a result, what happens? You educate the population to use 
VPN services and, uh, and similar. So suddenly we see traffic, uh, we, see, we see traffic obfuscated. Uh, on a lower level, we see proxies being used. So people have learned to get Netflix, for example, to get around these pirate bay blocks. They just use a DNS uh, service that's, that's offshore. So suddenly we are leaking what really governments are starting to realize is really valuable information when aggregated, they're DNS queries. So when you are looking up where a domain name, you know, just the IP address for a domain name, which reveals a huge amount about you and your internet traffic, really, it's very intrusive information, even, even if it doesn't have any content. What, what domain names you're looking up, where you're sending emails to, that information is now being sent to random third parties around the internet. Exactly the consequences we wanted to avoid from a national security perspective. Um, we've also seen uh, uh, um, IP4 run out at, at kind of exactly the same time uh, um, that where, where there's been a lot of government attention on this. And rather than sort of, sort of gracefully transition to IP6, nasty standard though it is, it's a heck of a lot better than the alternative, which is, which is that we've, we've just gone wholesale for carry grade NAT. And again, from a law enforcement perspective, we have almost literally shot ourselves in the foot. We, we, it, it, it's, it, it's a problem that the FBI and the DOJ call going dark. And so again, by, by failing to plan, by putting in stopgap measures, we end, up, we end up actually making lives more difficult for ourselves. And let's not forget, I'm speaking from a law enforcement perspective, but I'm a European cop. That means I care about privacy. <laughs> Um, these are not orthogonal. They are the same thing. If we have a bunch of hacked computers, if we have DNS leakage, these, these are things that make it harder for cops to do their job, but also endangers your privacy and our privacy as users. So let, let's, let's, I had a really stupid discussion earlier this morning that said, that said, would you choose privacy or would you choose security? It's not, let's not, let's not have this in this session, please. They're, they're the same, they're aligned with one another. And if cops can, you know, if, if cops are saying they can't do their job, because of, because of encryption and so on and so forth. They need to get better techniques. Um, I, I, I will just plug a, a good news story uh, that we've been working on, which is an excellent example of, uh, uh, including Christine and, and many other people have been, been cooperating with, which is the recent Avalanche Andromeda takedown. Uh, 40 different countries, 50 different national registries participated. Nobody blew the case. Everybody kept security. Nobody blabbed to the media and we successfully took down uh, a, a botnet that was, uh, at the time we took it down, had two million victims. That's two million victims protected, thanks to this huge in piece of international cooperation. Um, Internet and Jurisdiction, have, uh, uh, Bertrand de La Chapelle's project, has written a really good write-up uh, for Center, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're minded to read more. But that's uh, props to Microsoft for, uh, uh, and uh, international law enforcement for working on that one, and all the registries. Um, so some themes to think about there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benedict. That was very interesting. Some, some good ideas there on, on how policy can actually go very wrong. As in when we try to regulate something, it, it might lead to people making decisions that are less secure. With that, I'd like to make a little bit of time for questions, but we'll have a look first if there are any uh, questions from remote attendees. Nothing? Okay, then are there questions or additions, discussion from the group here? Okay, if, yes, go ahead, Wout. Uh, Wout and others, thank you, Martin. Um, I would like to go back to where you said it's a harder to get governments and industry particip participation. As you know, I did a whole review about that and a session on day zero. I think I have some answers uh, for that you could think about for next year. Um, what was said is that mainly the resources at that side are perhaps a little bit less than elsewhere because they have to focus on many different topics. So what they advised is to try and find out what their top priority is. And once you call that, you will probably find focus, determination, commitment, and also define some sort of an end goal. Because if it remains vague, they will drop out of the process like has uh, yeah, happened a few times in, in, in the past. So my, that would be my idea to, to get more engagement, to, to pri find their priority and set together some sort of an end goal and a commitment to the process in between. And then perhaps, about, I've got some other things later, but this is, I think, the first yeah. possible way forward. Thank you very much, Wout. Um, I think we have time for one more. Any comments or additions on safe and reliable access or sh securing critical shared services? Again, the goal of 
This discussion is to get ideas that we may need to consider for the final document or get concerns that we may need to test against the individual proposals as well that have, uh, have come up. Anyone from the group? If not, in that case, we'll actually move on to the second set of, uh, of uh, policy options or policy areas, rather. And that was quite an interesting one because, um, as I mentioned earlier, we did have really good participation from civil society in our group. And so this was something that came up quite a bit and, and led to lively discussion. And it's really focused on how we can make sure that once data is collected, uh, that that data is actually used for the intended purpose and is in a way transparent to the user what happens with the data. And second, how can we make sure that uh, we protect internet users against potential abuse by authorities using those very same technologies. And with that, I'd like to give the word to uh, Deborah Brown from the Association of Progressive Communications for a first intervention. Thanks very much. I'm gonna sort of lean into the mic here. Um, so APC is uh, an international NGO and network of organizations, and we work to uh, improve access to the internet to advance uh, human rights, gender equality, and sustainable development. And for us, cybersecurity is a key dimension of that work. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just start off by acknowledging that technology can be a key enabler of the SDGs. And, but in order for that to happen, um, in order for technology to advance sustainable development, data, networks, devices, and most importantly, people must be secure. Um, and we, we've observed a trend of large-scale development projects relying on technology in order to implement sustainable development and achieve the SDGs. And we see some risks in some of the world's most vulnerable people um, with this, this approach. Um, just to give a few examples, in India uh, this year there were several reports of large-scale data breaches um, with the biometric-based identification system called Aadhaar. For example, in May 2017, it was reported that Aadhaar numbers and personal information of as many as 135 million Indians could have been leaked from four government portals due to lack of IT security practices. And there were additional reports throughout the year um, of similar cases. And so in order for people to trust these programs, in order to, for them to give up their data to, to um, be part of programs that can greatly improve their lives and achieve sustainable development, cybersecurity must be improved. Uh, one uh, example I would point to are the UN Global Pulse's privacy and data protection principles for harnessing big, big data for development and humanitarian action. These principles call for reasonable and appropriate technical and organizational safeguards to be put in place, in place to prevent unauthorized breaches of data and for also for risk and harm assessments to be undertaken to um, avoid any data breaches and to take risk, risk mitigation uh, steps before any new or su substantially changed project is undertaken. And I'd just like to maybe add one final point, which is that consent is very critical. People who face discrimination on the basis of gender, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity, age, or any other um, characteristic often are part of these programs and have their data collected for the provision of goods and services or to inform public policy in order to achieve the SDGs. In some cases, full, meaningful, and prior consent isn't there. In other cases, data may be collected for one purpose and then used for another. And if the data is insecure, then these vulnerable and at-risk groups can be the target of violence or discrimination or harassment. So I think um, often when there's the best of intentions to use technology to achieve the SDGs and sustainable development, there's some risks that come, come in hand with that. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. And I have to tell you, I was very excited when I saw the uh, APC submission this year because I was actually unaware of a lot of the principles that you outlined there. And I think uh, a lot of people from other stakeholder communities, like I'm from the technical community, aren't aware of a lot of these tools that they can actively use. So I think that was very valuable. Thank you. I'd also like to pass the word on this one to Matthew Shears with uh, G GP Digital. Thanks, Martin. <clears throat> Um, what's really interesting about these uh, policy areas that you listed is that so many of them are interlinked and in a way indivisible. Um, and um, I think that points to some of the challenges with addressing um, this one in particular. Um, so let me just say a couple of things and, and point to Deborah's 
covered off on the human rights thing, let me just point up a, a, a number of and the implications of some security considerations which are actually critical to um, data theft and will become only increasingly um, critical. I think we, 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 it's obvious, it's stating the obvious that we face an increasingly data rich and connected future and that means that we're going to have to work, work ever harder to prevent that from becoming an increasingly data insecure future. Um, we look at these concerns have to be addressed, otherwise we're pretty much at risk, I think much to, in the direction that Deborah was going, that we're stepping into a privacy-less future in which the capabilities of technologies will, um, for extract, extracting and analyzing data will far outpace the appropriate societal or policy responses and our ability to exercise reasonable levels of control. Um, one of the biggest challenges we'll face, and I think it's um, a pretty obvious one, is, is ensuring the appropriate level of security in a range of devices that we are going to become more and more familiar with, which are those devices that are um, um, direct, uh, in for sale, at points of sale that will be accessible to consumers. So we're talking about consumer market, small home, small business market, where the market pressures um, – particularly in terms of device cost, will determine levels of security that are embedded in them. And that poses a significant challenge, not only for manufacturers, but also for the users in terms of understanding what those levels of security are, how they might be upgraded, whether they're upgradable or not. And this comes directly back to the issue of theft, because the only way that you can actually prevent that kind of theft and possible repurposing of data is to be far more aware of your responsibility in terms of cyber hygiene and far more aware of the technological capabilities of the devices that we're connecting to the network. So it's a, a set of challenges that we have to um, become very familiar with. And, and, and the Mirai uh, attack that took down the DIN web service is a very clear example of, the, the, of how much we as consumers, and not just internet policy experts, have to be aware of what we're connecting to the network, not only to protect our own information and data, but also to protect the network itself. So I'll leave it, leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, a very different perspective, but I think it kind of aligns well with the, the problem itself. And um, avoiding that insecure or data insecure future is exactly one of the goals that we have as part of the work that we're doing here. So thank you very much. Um, are there any comments or suggestions or, or things that you haven't heard yet in, in the audience that you think are important that we take along in this paper and in this work? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Siva Subramaniam. I'm from the Internet Society India Chennai chapter. We had a roundtable discussion on the broader aspects of uh, cybersecurity, which is not uh, quite uh, any different from um, the broader security uh, area. And uh, one of the things that we identified is that the application environment um, promoted by uh, operating systems like Android that needs a bit of uh, cleanup, and that needs a, a bit of attention from um, uh, Apple, from uh, Google, and from other uh, ecosystems. And so, in the initial stages, uh, they were giving out uh, permission. They, they were allowing uh, applications to have asked for any permission in in order to foster a, a application environment. And now that it's fostered, and there are thousands and uh, thousands of applications. It is time for the companies to move on to the next next phase of ensuring that uh, these applications are cleaned up. So that's one of the very important aspects. And then another core aspect is a uh, much broader aspect is that uh, we've been responding to security threats, uh, which were quite real. And some of the measures that are taken by law and order agencies and governments are quite warranted. But then we ended up uh, altering the way we live our lives. And uh, if we look at uh, how we live our lives uh, today and how we lived our lives 25 years ago, there is a drastic difference. And uh, is, the, is there any way by which uh, we could have uh, more uh, conducive policies that uh, does not take away our freedom and does not alter the way we all live our lives? That's a much, much broader question that needs to be examined by governments and security agencies. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Definitely two very important areas, like policy confusion uh, didn't come up specifically in the discussion this year, but I think it's, it's definitely a challenge in a sense as, as more and more of these policies come to be and there's a, a certain growth of them, how do we make sure that they don't lead to an environment where we lose a lot of control as, as users? So definitely a good point that we can we can take forward. Uh, the first one, uh, also very relevant, that uh, we, we had some discussion in the group about um, software development life cycle and how to make sure that, that we incentivize and, and promote the idea that software needs to be developed to be, um, or in a secure way. Um, I kind of want to check into my left and, and look at Kaya. I know that she cannot um, represent the, the ecosystem that you just mentioned, but I'm wondering if you have anything that you'd like to add on that, because it was a little part of uh, of previous contributions actually in previous years by Microsoft. Yeah, no, and I, I think I would generally, you know, Microsoft generally strongly feels and supports that um, there is a need for both your point earlier, I think, increase the understanding of IT professionals overall um, as they come out of university to sort of ensure that at university, but even earlier, there is a specific cybersecurity aspect to that. Um, I think I know we, in our own internal processes, have lots, have basically adopted an approach where it's we hire people and then we train them on security. <laughs> um, and um, I know that's not necessarily scalable. And I think the the important thing there is also to think about, you know, there is now I think uh, almost a proliferation on, over the last two years of specific cybersecurity degrees, and that's all good and great, but you actually need it across the IT ecosystem. Um, in ter and similarly in terms of um, sort of secure by design software development lifecycle approaches, um, we have tried and put out um, sort of materials actually into, and in, into international standards to sort of, for, for people to be able to access and learn what we learned when we had to go through this actually quite steep learning uh, scope over the last sort of 15 years. Um, but I think um, it's, and, and this is, and I think we're increasingly doing things in an area where um, we are moving into IoT and um, also artificial intelligence engineering to, to, to an extent where a lot of the, in particular in IoT, a lot of the sort of devices uh, that are put into the market, and I, I would encourage you not to just think about the consumer devices, but also devices that are being introduced and integrated into critical infrastructure, into enterprises, are sort of being, still being done so without almost security as an afterthought, if at all. Um, so understanding what can be done there with this dramatic, um, with that dramatic expansion of the threat landscape, and you know, whether it's just training or whether it is um, a, a, you know, a collective effort to find a way to, to to engineer security in the network traffic in some way, um, it's something to think about. Does thank you very much. Uh, yes, the gentleman at the back. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Jim Sinulufuye, the chair of AFICTA. Well, there is one word I've not uh, heard much about with respect to securing the infrastructure and uh, enhancing cyber security, and that's regulation. Uh, Matthew Chess talked about uh, the DNA attack, which has been massive, and uh, the last speaker also talked about IoT, artificial intelligence. What, what does it take about regulation? It's a good question. Is there anyone on the panel who would like to, to tackle this and maybe share some of your thoughts on it? Sorry? Oh, if you would like to, Benedict, go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, we're not in a regulation-free zone. We're, we're in, in a zone of overlap of regulations. So um, the Dyn attack uh, um, that you refer to, this is also the same uh, botnet of insecure Internet of Things devices, mostly home TV recorders and security camera systems that had default passwords set, cheap, nasty devices that are connected to fast broadband connections. There's plenty of regulation around these. There's plenty of regulation around the network. There's no enforcement. <laughs> That's the problem, I would argue. So regulators, are, regulators produce guidance for these systems. They're sold often from China into many different countries. Those countries have varying levels of cybersecurity standards, but also consumer protection standards. 
civil legislation, all of which could be used by both law enforcement or more likely by consumer protection agencies to hold these, co these companies responsible. Instead, what happened? Some person, in fact, I was involved in his arrest, Daniel, Daniel Kay, gathered all these machines together. Trivial, really trivial attack. So stupid, really. And th this is what's scary. And fired them both at Dine, took out a bunch of internet infrastructure, but also at the country of Liberia just before its elections. So these, this same network of hacked devices was directly used to influence an election because we failed collectively. So when you talk, talk about regulation, it's not the problem. I, I, in, my, in my opinion, it's, it's about actually understanding in each country that we all have responsibility for not buying crap devices, excuse my language, and, not, and then actually if we do have crap devices, excuse my language again, in the country, then we, that we, we remove them. And, and as a law enforcement person, I hate to say this, but I just read the manifesto of a person uh, called, uh, what's his name, Kavor, Dr. Kaborkian. Did you see this one? Anybody read this? So, there was, so this, over the last 18 months, that there's been a, a concerted attempt by, an organi by a, 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 a hack, hacker, if you like, who took over IoT devices that were vulnerable and destroyed them using software, about, I think about 10 to 20 million devices. Because this hacker, who believed they were doing the right thing, whether you agree or not, said that by destroying consumers' devices and getting them to say, oh, it's broken, and take it back to the shop for a refund, was the only meaningful way to highlight these bugs, to highlight these terrible flaws with these devices, and actually create an economic incentive for companies and manufacturers to do something about it. And guess what? Two manufacturers did. So it, it seems that vigilantism actually is the only thing standing be between us and com complete chaos at this point. Now, that's not necessarily the lesson I want you to go away with. <laughs> but that's, that's how bad things are about. Sorry. May, may I just, a quick follow-up. Maybe one of the outcomes would be to encourage regulators to be, to be responsive to what they need to do. Yep. Thank you very much for that comment, and thanks for the discussion. I think we have one more uh, comment before we go into the next section. Go ahead, Bob. Well, th thank you for mentioning this, Benedict, because it's, it's exactly what the, the, the duties of care document of the Dutch Cyber Security Council published this year proves, is that there are so many, so many regulations already out there, or, or consumer protection agencies regulations out there that are simply not used on, on the products that we buy. That's one, one comment. The other one, I want to re, re, point out that in the anti-spam uh, best practice forum of two years ago, there was something about a book called Future Crimes by Mark Goodman from the Singularity University, I think in San Francisco or Los Angeles. And he pointed out as a potential solution to the threats from all these bugs in software. And he, he made a, a comparison to malaria fighting in the world, that there were hundreds of thousands of people putting data in on malaria around the world, and that ha actually helped scientists on the way to cures, which is around the corner, actually, at this point in time, I believe. If we were to do something like that on software by, by all these people who are out there find, trying to find bugs in software and collect that at a, at a single point, and that, this is Mark's idea and not mine, but it's in the BPF outcome as a recommendation. If that is something that could be organized by or by companies like Microsoft together perhaps with governments and set up some sort of a neutral entity in which they come together, then we may speed up all the bugs in the software 10, 100, 100 a thousand times faster than happens at this point in time. And I think that may be a good idea to explore in the next year because we left it somewhere in the mix of the two ones. But because of the discussion, I just thought of it and wanted to bring it back to the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fart. And I think Christine actually wanted to add something as well earlier. So, and I'm even like you touched a point that I touched the other day in another panel, uh, the panel about C search. So um, I think it. Google is already doing something like that with this uh, open source software uh, fuzzing network. So they have now continuous testing of the major open source software. And they even presented that if at the time the heart bleed was discovered, they had that system in place, it would take 10 minutes to find it. 
So there are already some initiatives. In the case of Google, they're focusing on the open source software that they use, so of course. But then you have another perverse incentive, that is uh, it, we needed to have not a place for people to report, but really people looking for bugs. And because we have a market where zero days are too expensive and is a market driven by government policy, so it's the kind of perverse effects of policy. I think part of the bad problem we have today is really this market for zero days. But one of the things I wanted to comment early on the policy and on the Android ecosystem is a little bit, I'm going to touch it back later in the session, but I think uh, one of the key problems is not only that we don't have professionals well trained, the university is putting professionals that the companies have to retrain. So all in the major companies can do that. So, and then at the other side, we have businesses that are not software businesses or were not until now, that now are just software shops. And they have the early 90s behavior of software companies and not the 21st century behavior. So, and this is happening in IoT, and this is also happening, and it's very worried in the OEM carrier model for cell phones. So part of the problem that we have today with the market of cell phones is that the OEMs, the, the people that do the, the mobile phones, they still think in that very old telecom mindset that they have this, I make it, and then I make something specialized for the carrier, and nobody's going to touch that anymore. So they need to realize that they are not just OEM for cell phones. They are software companies. And if they are using an open source software, they need to give it the option for that software to be updated. So it's really uh, so many uh, stakeholders that are making bad decisions and that are just piling up into all this. So I think it's, it's a very complex problem to deal in the future. So this alone would be a policy challenge for years to come. Thank you very much, Christine. Moving on to the next slide, I think we're actually going to jump into a, a, a new topic. So regarding the poll, oh, I see one more question at the back. I think we have time for one more, so go ahead. Thank you. I want to come back to the, I'm uh, Jens Kessner with the Swiss Telecoms Regulator. I want to come back to the claim that IoT devices were already covered by consumer protection law. That is not the case in Switzerland. And I mean, Consumer protection law does not keep them from being part of, bot of the botnet. And I'm not even sure that introducing such consumer law would change anything about the motivation of the device creators. So I don't think that's um, the road to follow. Okay. Thank you for adding that. Um, I'm going to jump into the next section really briefly, and I just want to thank you all for adding discussion here to what we have in the document. What we'll do is we'll take some of these comments and integrate them in the document moving forward, and if there are issues that aren't exactly, we're not exactly able to close on here, we may pick them up on our mailing list, so I highly recommend that you join it if you have the ability to contribute a little bit of time at, uh, at finding good solutions for each of these problems. Now, at the end of the year, we started thinking through what areas were that we could work on in the next few years if the best practices forum is renewed. Uh, the way that we did that is we actually asked people what their biggest challenges were in terms of cybersecurity, and in particular those challenges that we could address meaningfully in a multi-stakeholder way. So if something is a pure technical issue that can only be addressed by one actor, it probably isn't, um, the IGF probably isn't the best place to discuss it. We came up with a number of different areas, and, and for the meeting, I, I divided those into policy and governance issues, um, technical issues, and then one that particularly stood out, which was fostering a culture of cybersecurity and core values. And that one was interesting because we spent a fair amount of our time talking about education, about what cybersecurity truly meant. Uh, one of the most interesting threads, in, in my view, to read up on in the last year was whether or not an internet shutdown was a cybersecurity issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually found myself persuaded by some arguments that were brought up on the list. And I think others at least had some, some things to think about afterwards. But it all led to the fact that there is actually disagreement on what cybersecurity really means. Um, and the definitions that do exist and that have been built aren't universally accepted. 
Um, I'll walk through the technical issues really quickly. Uh, Internet of Things came up in quite a few submissions. Uh, critical infrastructure, internet resources. Uh, a number of very specific types of attacks that typically manifest themselves in a way that, that affects multiple stakeholders to address them. Cybercrime and ransomware. Cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, in particular the, uh, the possible discriminative uh, results of using those algorithms when it's not really understood how a decision is made. Mobile network security, abuse, and a lack of education and end user awareness. And finally, policy and governance issues, um, development of internationally agreed upon cyber norms, uh, the lack of frameworks to foster international cooperation and legal principles, state stability and peace in cyberspace, which was definitely a big part of the main session yesterday, so that was quite interesting. Um, increasing awareness of risk management processes. And one particular concern that I thought was very interesting was the fact that people look too much for solutions that solve it all, and so they don't pursue the ones that get us to 80%. So that was raised as a very specific challenge, which I think was quite interesting. And then awareness of criminal justice practices. Now, when we ended up looking at the work that we may do in 2018, um, two specific things really stood out. The first one was culture, values, and norms. So we talked about defining cybersecurity, making sure that stakeholder groups understand it the same way, and identifying what values are underneath them. And, uh, and that can be something that then leads to assessing, debating, and improving on cybersecurity norms wherever they're developed. Uh, we have two experts in the area on our panel, and I'd like to give them the word to talk a little bit about what they've seen and what they see as the future. And in particular, I would like to challenge them with the question how um, communities that may not be states can contribute to these initiatives, so civil society and the technical community. And I'd like to give the word first to Alexander Klimburg from the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Uh, thank you. So I'm the director of the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace Initiative and the head of the Secretariat. So we are a multi-stakeholder endeavor that um, aims to develop norms and policy initiatives to help advance uh, international peace and security issues in cyberspace. So this BPF document is uh, pretty exciting for us because it marks the norms of responsible behavior as one of the key areas for future uh, stakeholder conversation. And uh, the quote you have in it, it's necessary to, in, in order to establish a set of principles and values understood by each stakeholder group. And that is pretty much exactly the language we have been using within the UN group of government experts and other governmental experts and other organizations that have been dedicated to the so-called international peace and security discussion and cybersecurity. So I think it's important to, to advance that norms are non-legally binding voluntary agreements that can be made by any stakeholder group. So they don't only apply to states, not only states make them. ISOC, for instance, has created uh, a norm called manners for, for routing, and there are many other similar forms of explicit and implicit norms that are currently being exercised. So they're not laws, but they're agreements on principles, and they always have, they're always a somewhat a matter of interpretation. And they provide soft incentives and soft disincentives for adherence. So this is a continuation, more or less, of Christine Hopper's question, how do we incentivize good behavior, like adopting DNSSEC or BCP38 source address validation, or a lot of these technical issues that come up, where we sometimes think in terms of regulation, or we sometimes think in terms of contract design. Another solution are norms. So norms, as I said, are a highly, highly welcome conversation, uh, addition to the conversation here. So norms have been used uh, in the UNGG context since 2013 and 2015. In 2013, the UNGGE report effectively endorsed regional organizations to help develop their own norms and confidence building measures. And in 2015, they even put forward some concrete norms of their own. And those norms were, for instance, thou shall not interfere with critical infrastructure, or thou shall not attack certs, or thou shall assist another state in mitigating a serious cyber incident. Of course, all these norms are only applicable in peacetime. In wartime, of course, different laws apply. So norms uh, were developed for states in this context, and that was part of the problem. So the UNGGE realized that it needed to open up a little bit and be accessible to a wider group of stakeholders, and that was also part of their 2015 report, which I will spare reading to you in full. It is a bit dry. But one of the two mandates of the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace is the UNGGE recognition that they had to expand stakeholder participation. And in particular, it was necessary to be able to inform 
the norm development process that occurs within the UN First Committee International Peace and Security Community. So we believe that one of these norms, for instance, is the one that we've just recently introduced, which is the call to protect the public core of the Internet. And this is what we find so particularly exciting, is that, that this call to protect the public core of the Internet is potentially connectable to something that you've been discussing here today, which is a principle and a further form of incorporating a common belief, uh, particularly a do-no-harm principle. So, for instance, I want to quickly read out what that norm is. It's extremely short, which is usually a good sign. And that reads, without prejudice to the rights and obligations, state and non-state actors should not conduct or knowingly allow activity that intentionally or substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the Internet and therefore the stability of cyberspace. So, of course, the big question is, what is this public core formed out of? In this context, we had a nice and involved discussion that's also uh, in our BPF submission about an inner core and an outer core. Now, the inner core is kind of clearly identifiable as the so-called naming and forwarding functions of the Internet, DNS, BGP, et cetera. And that's kind of clear that that really does, um, that, that really is crucial for the, for, the, for the proper functioning of the Internet as a whole. The outer core is a bit more fuzzy, and that can include a whole range of different assets, including, for instance, cables or Internet exchange points or, for instance, even certification systems. So that's not exactly clear what falls into this area, and this is one of the things that we're hoping for feedback from, from both this community and other communities, to find out exactly what assets, what services are included here. But it's also a chance, a chance to think more about a principle-based approach to these issues. So we think that the outer core can be used as a point of departure to talk about a general precautionary principle, both for state and for non-state actors. So, for instance, for state actors, it's important that they consider that when they're engaging in lawful activity in peacetime, and that does include espionage under international law, that they don't do something that inadvertently damages the core, for instance, by wide-scale disruption of routing, for instance. If we want to look at a recent example, just look back three, four weeks ago what happened in a certain AS in Russia, for instance. Um, that's one example, but this also applies to non-state actors. And for non-state actors, it's quite simple. If you are offering a product or service that can be misused to cause widespread out outage or disruption, then you should commit to an enhanced level of due diligence on your systems to effectively make it, make it at least somewhat plausible that your service or product will not be misused to such a nefarious purpose. And that basically means that you're committing to a do-no-harm principle, um, effectively taking a higher level of care into consideration on the basis that just might, you just might be essential to the operation of the Internet, at least for a short period of time, and therefore have an obligation beyond those of your stakeholders, um, such as your shareholders. So we are hoping that, for instance, something like protecting the public core could actually become something like a, a, a do-no-harm principle for core service and product developers that could maybe stand next to the end-to-end -end principle, universal access principle, open standard principles, and other many principles that are being developed, do-no-harm principle, cause, uh, et cetera, and effectively incentivize actors to um, take an extra level of care when their products and services might be of particular importance to the ecosystem as a whole. And sometimes, of course, it's quite helpful to spell these things out in writing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that contribution and, and sharing some of the exciting work that your organization is doing. Um, another organization that spent quite a bit of time the last few years actually talking about norms and, and in fact proposing a few has been uh, Microsoft and so we have Kaya here who can uh, tell us a little bit more about what they've done. Um, sure. So um, I think I would first of all like to sort of echo um, Alex I think and also praise the, the work of the commission. I think the work that you've been doing with it's kind of it's great, and uh, ha having the ability. And you are one of the few organizations that are organizations. The wrong word, but groups that um, sort of actually does bring in this space multi stakeholders together. I think the reason why Microsoft a uh, few years, I guess 2012, started talking about uh, international cybersecurity norms um, was largely because this was a debate that was held by governments for governments a little bit, like Alex referred to. Um, and we felt that there, there is a need to shine line, light on the process. There's a, there's a need to, uh, for those decision makers to hear voices from the industry and others. And um, so we sort of started making a fuss and proposing a few things. Um, I think it's great to see uh, the sort of norms inclusion here. I think we see it as a critical, important contribution to international 
peace and stability in cyberspace. And you, you, you probably, I'm, a, I'm sure you have, heard us talk about the Digital Geneva Convention this week. But I think that's more of a long-term process and, and so in the need to come to a set of agreements in the next few years around uh, norms of behavior for, cyber, for cyberspace for states and also non-state actors um, is, is critical. Um, so I think some of the ideas we, we proposed as part of this was to, um, you know, take the UNGG for the, two, the sort of the, their 2015 report that put forward 11 norms, as Alex referenced, as a starting point, for example, and sort of look at how these could, you know, have um, in, sort of informed multi-stakeholder discussion on how this could actually be implemented. I think states have looked at it. I feel that there is an obligation in the, as part of the resolution that was passed in the UN for them to report back on implementation of those norms. But there's sort of, I think, very, very few countries have actually done anything about it besides sort of commit to it in, 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 in theory. And oftentimes they're written as fairly vague statements. I don't think they are quite as you shall. Um, so, um, so, so there's a level of interpretation. I think it'd be important for uh, for us collectively to sort of investigate those. I think the other option, a little bit like Alice was saying, I think is also to try and identify what are other areas where norms would be needed. I think one of the, one of the calls that Microsoft put out uh, was sort of a norm of non-interference in electoral processes. That was sort of one that was um, highlighted sort of in the last year. But there are definitely others. Core, the core of the internet is something that we strongly support, um, and have and have you know the ability of having a conversation with academics, with the civil society to see what's important and around the world. Because also, I think it was very the debate so far has been very focused on a narrow s geographic scope. In all honesty, um, is something we'd like to see. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you both for being very practical as well with suggestions on where we can uh, actually contribute. I see a first question here at the front and then we'll go to the remote uh, yeah, uh, It's actually I'm uh, Siva Subramanian again from Internet Society India Chennai. I just want to react to what she said, which is positive that uh, industry participation and uh, developing norms and industry contribution. But the only predominant uh, non-state actor in the multi multilateral process is the industry. So it has always been, uh, when governments talk about a government-only process or a multilateral process, it's in reality it's not just a government-only process, but a government and industry partnership process uh, in many ways. And historically it has been the case. And so uh, when it's expanded as a multi-stakeholder process, then the civil society is brought in and there is a tremendous amount of balance. And so... I think we should have the shift from consulting just the industry to consulting everyone for a balance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll get to your question in a second. Are there any remote ones at this point in time? No? Okay, then go ahead. Okay, um, so I have a very specific question, actually. And uh, so um, uh, my name is Driart Shawne. I'm a doctor in computer sciences professor from uh, Pristina, Kosovo. Um, so uh, looking at the issues, specifically at the technical issues that you have um, showed just a couple of moments ago, I'm quite surprised, I would say, to not see specifically the issue of email security. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at how we're conducting businesses nowadays, everything is done via emails, um, not fully encrypted end to end. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a particularly sensitive issue, and I hope other cybersecurity experts uh, would agree, because um, uh, this is what, what, what's causing troubles, I would say, in the, in the cyberspace the most. And it's um, about the nature of the business that we're doing nowadays, uh, which goes completely via emails. And it's completely wrong how we are using emails in general. So we, we're having um, encryption between the email servers, but we're not having end-to-end -end encryption from the user to the end user. So. I think this is a particular issue that should be addressed. And um, uh, if not, I, I, would, I would like to have an, an explanation 
why you, you don't include it as a technical issue, yeah. this specific cybersecurity issue, which is email security. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for raising it. Uh, the reason why it wasn't included was because it didn't come up as any of the submissions. I'd encourage you to still send in um, more, more detailed feedback if you have it, and then perhaps it's something that we can tackle uh, as, the, as the process continues. But thank you. It's definitely a, an interesting addition. Um, I think Matt, you here wants to add something on the norms discussion as well. Thanks, Martin. Um, the, the challenge of the norms is that um, is one that Shiva just noted, which is you know many times as they're norms, but they're not necessarily geared towards or developed by a multi-stakeholder process, particularly in cybersecurity. So I just wanted to draw your attention to one set of norms that were developed through a multi-stakeholder process and that deal with cybersecurity and, and human rights, and that's the norms that came out of the Freedom Online Coalition Working Group One on an internet free and secure that developed 13 recommendations, and many of them are norms, about how cyber policies should be developed with uh, taking human rights into account. Just to give you a flavor of them, um, the, first, uh, the second one is the development of cybersecurity related laws, policies, and practices should be from their inception human rights respecting by design. So there's a real focus in that. And the interesting thing about these recommendations is that the work that was put into them has been supported by the 30 governments of the Freedom Online Coalition. So this is a part of the of the, the body of work that we can use to leverage to bring about um, an opening up of the cybersecurity space and to bring more multi-stakeholder engagement into that. So I recommend you look at them at freeandsecure.online. Thanks. Thank you for adding that, Matthew. Um, a second area of potential work for the next year that was brought up actually in, the, in our meeting at the GCCS was um, that we could work on the digital security divide. And this is a subdivision of the digital divide where historically it's been about users that were not able to access the internet due to very, uh, various limitations. And as that has been more and more addressed, there is a concern that users that either do not have the funding on, or don't have um, another way of accessing specific security measures may actually be using an internet that's less trustworthy than other users. And I'd actually like to give the word to Matthew as well first to uh, tell us a little bit about what um, ideas he has around that area that could potentially be useful for the BPF. And given that we're running out of time a little bit, I'm going to ask everyone to really limit it to two minutes of the next few speakers. Okay, so um, this is a really interesting challenge that, that came up out of, um, I mean, people are referring to this increasingly, but it came out, out of, up out of some work I was doing with the Internet Society on the Internet Futures report that was released in uh, September. And this is the fear that um, we're working very hard to address the access divide. Um, but when you start to consider the challenges globally and the differing levels of cyber awareness and the differing levels of development and the differing levels of financing for putting in place cyber security systems and processes and frameworks, the, the, it raises the specter of a security divide. So not just a digital divide, but rather, and not just an access divide, but a, but a security divide that in turn could imperil the progress that we're making on, an ac on the access divide. And I think this is not only a, a security divide issue, but it's also an SDG issue. So for example, if you take SDG 2, which is about zero hunger, you can, um, there they're calling for doubling agricultural production, and much of that is going to have to be done through embedding technologies into those production processes. Many control systems, you can imagine that those systems will be incredibly vulnerable without, vulnerable without the appropriate level of security, which could in turn imperil attaining the SDGs. So there's this issue of how, uh, this issue of the security divide um, has implications across the board. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, someone else that I'd really like to ask for her opinion on this is uh, Christine Hoopers. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I would like to make just uh, two brief points. And, and one point uh, is that a lot of the problems we see in Brazil, Brazil is a developing country. We have so far only half percent of the population that uses the internet. From this, more than half just uses cell phones. So is, is the, the current uh, trend. And one of the things, uh, w w Nick PR, that's the organization that hosts CERT PR, we have, um, we also conduct since 2005 all the national surveys about ICT use in the country. And if you try to cross questions for the households that are 
how security, how aware they are with security. It really relates with literacy. It's not only digital literacy, it's literacy. It's more than wealth and poor. It's really uh, how well educated they are, uh, if they have education form or if they don't. And uh, f then coming from our perspective that we produce a lot of end user awareness material that is still important. You can see that even for companies today, really the major thing is phishing, is targeted phishing, is whaling, and you go for the human element. We still need them. So it's really hard to do user awareness when the user does not understand the technology or the risk or the threat. And this goes then to have better technology, but then it goes back to what we discussed before, that we needed to have better software, not so faulty, a better ecosystem for smartphones, smartphones that could be updated and not like 10. Or, uh, in Brazil, we still have most of the smartphones that are being sold, they have at least uh, the Android for three years ago. So they are coming to the users without the ability, full of vulnerability. So I think it's really more of an ecosystem, as I said before, OEM carrier, industries realizing they are selling software, and thinking about creating a better ecosystem. But I think literacy is, is really a challenge for the, the digital security uh, divide, and, and I think we should think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And then finally, Deborah. Thank you. I wanted to um, highlight two types of, um, a breach of, of communities that might face more risks um, in digital security. Uh, the first relates to the point I made earlier that when data breaches of sensitive personal data occur, uh, certain communities are more at risk, such as women and um, people who face discrimination based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. To give an example from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, there was a database containing the records of 650,000 patients that was made public, including um, patients who underwent abortion procedures. And in Brazil, abortion is illegal even um, for people who might are at risk of carrying Zika. So if, if uh, those identities are made public and these women are then um, revealed to have their identity to have had an abortion, there's a, a much more um, severe consequence. And the second is that uh, women and people who face discrimination based on their sexual orientation are often proactively attacked or um, harassed online. And examples include threats of rape, of death, um, cyber stalking, hacking of email accounts, um, of mobile phones, and doxing. And these have consequences offline as well, especially when someone's address is made public and threats are made against them online. Um, and while there are lots of measures that could be put in place to, to um, prevent such threats, and I'll, I'll wrap up soon, um, the last year's BPF, the Best Practice Forum on Gender and Access, actually showed that one of the threats or one of the barriers to women's meaningful access and use of the internet are these threats online. So sometimes the threats just simply aren't worth being online and being exposed to them. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So these are two areas that we plan to uh, to consider working on for the next year if the BPF is renewed. Uh, I see one comment from Wout. Thank you, Mark, because I have to run off to because I have to oh. speak in a session that ends in 15 minutes. Um, I want to jump ahead to the rest of the program because three very short comments. As you see, we're already running out of time. What I would advise to do is ask the MAG for more flexibility on best practice for uh, and, and, and the whole program because topics came up this year that need a whole session to discuss and not just being mentioned. So two or three slots that could be filled in during the year while the process from the MAG is going on as it does. So more flexibility in the program for best practice for uh, and intersessional work in general. Two, if we have a success, let's learn to celebrate it. Let's put it out there because that makes us more attractive to others to, to, to participate in the future. So how do we identify success, how do we disseminate it, and then reach out. Three is more commitment from the MAG. Once they decided this is our topic of the year in a best practice forum, then we need commitment on reach out. So then it's not that we're on our own afterwards, but that needs some help. And the fourth is let's identify a case that we can work on together and work towards a common goal that is identified up front and whether that is in IoT or artificial intelligence or like the email security the gentleman very good example 
if we identify one very early on in the process, we may be able to get other people on board. And thank you very much for being able to tell it. And, ver and, and good luck with the report. And we'll definitely be whim and you finalize it. Thanks. Thank you, Arthur. There were some comments on the side there. The gentleman next to uh, Serge, I think, was first, and then we'll make Oh, um, you might want to speak up and I can okay. re repeat the question. <laughs> so, need other comments. Ah, okay. um, my name is Serge Rose. I'm also a member of the first board where I'm in charge of training and education. And, and when it comes to kind of cultural values and digital divide, I, I feel there is a lot that these two have in common. When we deliver trainings in the so-called difficult locations, what I often see is not that people there have little knowledge or bad technology, but what I often hear is that when we call the big companies or reach out to so-called developed nations, we don't get an answer. And when I ask in the so-called developed nations or the big tech companies, why do, don't you answer, I get the answer back saying, well, they always ask such strange questions. And that for me is a sign that, that we have a cultural gap. We don't seem to understand each other. And I think this is something that, that we really need to address. I mean, we put the fibers there, but we still need to learn each other's language. And I would really like to see this aspect flowing in because it's, it's not about the best dictating those people how they have to do and how, have to run the internet. Uh, it's also not those people telling us you have to do it this way, but we have to find a common way to work on this common infrastructure. Okay. Thank you, Serge. And I was just informed that we're actually running out of time. So what we'll do is if you quickly go to the next slide, please. Um, there's an additional session tomorrow at 1.30 uh, where we'll have time to discuss next year's work. So I would recommend if you have suggestions or discussion, please come there and happy to address them. Otherwise, sign up to the mailing list. And there you can also bring up anything that you would have liked to bring up and we didn't have time for. We'd be happy to engage in discussion there. With that, I'd like to hand it back to Marcus for a second uh, to just, give a few closing words. Well, I mean, just to say uh, what Martin said, we will have this session tomorrow and maybe also decluster the issue. It's not a binary thing whether we are going to continue as a best practice forum on cybersecurity, but it is about making suggestions to the MAG then for issues and that may be taken up also somewhere else in the context of the IGF. That may be a main session, whatever, but it is good. It's tremendous work these experts have done over the year and if we can come up with some reasoned suggestions for future work and not just say this is what we want to do as best practice forum on cybersecurity, these are interesting issues, but present the issues in a reasoned manner for consideration to the new MAG in the new year. So, and we can continue the discussion also in substance if there are questions. It's good to have a vibrant discussion and it was an excellent discussion we had, but unfortunately, we have to vacate the room. There will be other people coming in. So sorry to cut down on the questions, but it's always better to leave when you still have appetite and not sat completely bored stiff with everything has been said, but not yet by everyone. So thank you all for participating actively. And our thanks, of course, go to Martin and all the panelists. Thank you.
Good afternoon to everybody and welcome at our flash session dedicated to Internet Literacy Book, a handbook. Uh, I'm Corina Kalugaru uh, and I'm ambassador and permanent representative of the Republic of Moldova to the Council of Europe, but at the same time I have the pleasure and honor to be the thematic coordinator of the Committee of Ministers for Information Policy. So, as you so at the entrance of this room, we will present today the, the new Internet Literacy Handbook, uh, and I will invite everybody to, to take and to, to look into this amazing book. So we have today the, the, the privilege to have the authors uh, um, of the handbook, which are present uh, next to me uh, during our discussions. So um, I will introduce um, here Janice Richardson, Elizabeth Milovidov, and Martin Schmaltzried. <laughs> Sorry if something. <laughs> Our discussions will be separated in three quiz. At the end uh, of our flash session, we'll have the prices because we are uh, before uh, end of the year and uh, before the Christmas. So the participants that will be more active, they will receive uh, the prizes. So now I will we'll go directly into the concrete discussions. And uh, the first quiz will be dedicated to the most, uh, uh, to the ideas that are uh, in the handbook. And uh, I will ask um, Elizabeth, what is the, Janice. Janice, what is the Internet Literacy Handbook and was when was the first LH written and why is necessary to update it, taking into account that the Council of Europe has issued uh, this book in 2003? And 2006 and 2009. So <laughs> please. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this session. So what is the Internet Literacy Handbook? Well, I hope you can tell me because you've perhaps already opened it. It's our attempt to bring tools, resources, links, everything that a teacher would need to know under the same umbrella into a one-shop stop where they can gather this information, where parents, families also can find informa information, but also, and very importantly, issues that may impact human rights, ethical issues that these various forms of technology raise. And it's broken down, this new version is broken down into a number of sections which cover in turn inclusion, creativity, participation, fun, challenges, future. I think the important part of this, we had to update from 2003, obviously, because so much has happened in this field. Every time we update, new chapters are added until we have what you see inside the book today. I think we're, we're getting on to 30 chapters. The other big change of this book, which you're going to see, is rather than introducing a resource uh, rather than introducing an index, we've given users a quiz. And the quiz not only tells you what's in the booklet, but also tests your knowledge on what you will find in each chapter. So back to you. And that was my quiz. Now it's going to be your turn. Thank you very much. Um, it is true that the internet has developing and is developing uh, every hour and every minute. So we have many stakeholders, we have government, we have society, we have internet providers, but most importantly, we have users of the internet. And uh, it's really important to be uh, very explicit uh, for the children, for the parents, for the teachers, how we can use the internet in the advantage and not in, the, in our disadvantage, where how we can be how we can protect our rights uh, to avoid uh, any kind of violations. So I will invite now Janice, uh, um, uh, Elizabeth, to, to tell us more why it was important now to update the handbook and how do you think that it can be used in, in a positive way um, 
by the people that are working in this field. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to see everyone here. I can't wait for the quiz. Um, to answer the question, um, it was so important to, to update the, the handbook because of all the new things that are happening. Uh, the new technologies, the Wi-Fi connected toys, the bots, the malware. There are so many things on the horizon that are both exciting uh, and beneficial to society, but we also have to know how to understand the, the risk and the benefits uh, in, a, in a way that is helpful for all. One of the things that was really interesting about this handbook uh, was the fact that we added more fact sheets and always keeping an eye out for the children, um, trying to have ideas for the classroom, best practices, because really at the heart of what we're doing for the Council of Europe, we're looking as, at children as the future. And so if they're able to understand and navigate uh, the internet, technology, and social media responsibly and safely, then we're very happy. Thank you. Martin, you, you have expertise to work in developing the programs for parents and uh, children. What do you think that is necessary, or at least how for a parent that doesn't know many things about the handbook can use it? Well, I think what's nice is that the handbook really starts at the beginning, even for a parent that has no idea. I mean, the first chapter is getting connected, so it's really about somebody that has no technical knowledge uh, oh, really an introduction at how the internet works and it just works up from there. So, you know, chapter by chapter you go deeper and deeper into what the web is, uh, the different facets, the different uh, things that you find uh, from basic things like emailing to more complex things like big data and, you know, what, what, what's at stake there. So I think what's nice is that regardless of your, your kind of area or, or expertise level, um, you really have, you can work through these, these uh, different fact sheets um, based on your knowledge, from starting from nothing or starting from something, uh, and work your way up and really build uh, this kind of knowledge. And, and what's also nice is that every fact sheet is also broken up into different parts, and you always have, you know, some key points about like ethics, ethical considerations. What are the issues? Um, what are like some recommendations, uh, some things that you need to think about, some activities you can do. So really for each of them you have some interactive things that you can do and so, so that's kind of the two, the two reasons why I think you know, it's, it's good for any, any parent, any family and any team. Thank you. And as uh, we begin our discussions we have three quiz. The first quiz is uh, and it will be the questions to the audience as well. Uh, what are the most relevant sections of the handbooks that you are seeing in front of you? Just switch to Elizabeth. In order to be easier for uh, all of you, I will ask Elizabeth to. Uh, Explain to us the most important uh, elements. Um, actually, I won't explain. I will have you go ahead and look through. You'll see up on the, on the board there, uh, you'll see the, the six different areas. And just take a peek, because what we're going to do uh, in just a second is that we will go through some of the questions, but I just want you to be a little familiar with what's inside. Nothing more at the moment. Um, later, you can tell us what you feel is the most relevant sections for your areas and your expertise, as we would very much like to know. Um, but I would like to just um, turn the floor over to Janice for a moment because you were going to talk about the, the contents and the objectives uh, of the Internet Literacy Handbook, and so I'm going to change the slide. Janice will just jump in. For those of you who've been following education over the past 20 years, you are possibly aware of something written by Jacques Delors, which has been taken up with, from, by educators across the world. And Jacques Delors really insisted that in fact, educating today, educating at a time when knowledge is renewed at such a rapid place, we instead have to focus on four objectives. One, learning to learn so that we can keep up to date. Two, learning to do. Three, learning to be. And four, learning to live together. And I would say that these are the principal objectives 
that are entwined right through this book. Um, Elizabeth, I believe that you were going to animate a quiz. Yes, yeah, yeah, let's get going. <laughs> So, um, we're going to do a very, uh, thank you, Martin. We're going to do an interactive quiz. So please pay attention. As you know, there will be prizes. There will be. <coughs> and I'm having trouble with my clicker. I should probably get closer. There we go. Um, you will not get money. You're looking at the screen now. There's no money, but uh, you will have other prizes, okay? So, <laughs> so please stay with me. So the first quiz, and we also have to figure out, because we will be asking you several questions. Um, what, would, what do you think, Ambassador? Should they answer by themselves? Do they have a chance? We have three prizes. Okay. Or should they answer with teams? In the team, easier. OK, so then buddy up with a partner. Find somebody who looks really intelligent. <laughs> OK. OK. You'll have to share the prizes. Yep, yeah, you're going to have to share the prizes. And um, Martin, are you going to keep track of who raises their hand first? Yes? Just, okay, just um, look. Oh, it's speed. Yeah, okay, it's going to be speed, yes. You have just uh, 45 se seconds. Mm hmm OK, so the very first question, and always because I'm so far, there we go. So who provided the four pillars of education, learning to know, learning to do, to be, and to live together that are now so applicable to digital citizenship. Oh, was it, uh, yeah, well, Janice didn't see all of my slides. <laughs> no, was it um, A, the Council of Europe? I think I'm going to have to hand my clicker down. B, the European Commission? Nope, I'm going to have to hand it down. Oh, it's working slowly. C, UNESCO? or D, the OECD? I already see one hand up in the far, far back. Thank you, Janice. Wait, wait. <laughs> I thought I'd make the first one easy. OK, so for that slide, that's everything that's on digital citizenship. And you guys can take a look in your handbook, and you will see that that is fact sheet number 17. And in this fact sheet, it's divided up where we talk about the importance of education, we talk about ethical uh, considerations and risks. We have ideas for classroom work, and there are good practices. You will see that sort of division in every single fact sheet. But what I particularly like about this one is that we define digital citizenship, uh, digital footprints, digital identity, <laughs> digital literacy, digital rights, and e-democracy. So there you go. You now understand what's in fact sheet number 17. Okay, so now you're going to do a bit of a treasure hunt. So pull out your smartphones or your computers, and I would like you to find this web page. And on this web page, you will see what is the definition of citizenship. That's all I'm going to show you. And it's over. So it's starting. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Find it. What is the definition of digital citizenship that was on the website page of the Council of Europe? And obviously, I'm making sure that you understand where to find all these fabulous resources that we've worked so hard to produce for you. I'm looking for some hands. Uh, and what does the wait, definition wait. say? This. Oh, the, the, right over here, but he put his oh, hand up okay. first. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay, go, ahead. go in the far back. On, On the microphone, please. And what does it say? Digital citizenship refers to? The competent and positive engagement with digital technologies, uh, participating actively and responsibly, uh, sure. being involved in the double process of lifelong learning, and continuously defending human dignity. And are you, what we, website are you on? Uh, that would be the coe.int, right? Yes, but you're supposed to be under the Digital Citizenship Education webpage. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, it's trickier than you thought. Go ahead. Mm. Oh, sorry, I'm not. Uh, I will defer to the ambassador. It's just in front of us. Yeah. Mm. Digital citizenship refers to the ability to engage positively, critically, and competently in the digital environment, drawing on the skills of effective communication and creation to practice forms of social participation that are respectful of human rights and dignity through the responsible use of technology. Thank you. 
And obviously the reason why is because we're also working on a digital citizenship handbook, which we'll be seeing that will follow this same module. You'll see this in the next year, uh, and that is with the Digital Citizenship Education Project. So for digital parenting, is everybody ready? What is the number one recommended step for parenting in the digital age? Is it open communication? Open Wi-Fi or open the wine? Okay. <laughs> Please. Uh, the, uh, Good. Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> as Janice gave one away, I had two as well. So for digital parenting, um, you will see that this is fact sheet 18, and we talk about both positive and proactive uh, digital parenting. And what's also interesting in this section, of course it's my favorite section, is that we really try to um, help parents understand that there are so many incredible opportunities online, but that they have to be with their children. And while I do always like to say to bring their offline skills and parenting skills online, I know that it sounds like uh, I'm telling them that they can just easily parent uh, online. It's not the same thing, obviously, but you do have to be just as vigilant uh, and, and, and a responsible guardian of your child's reputation online and offline. Okay, so. What are two types of cyber crimes that involve demands of money or Bitcoin to stop the harassing activity? Is it A, malware and bots, B, ransom and sextortion, C, phishing and spamming, D, clickjacking and 419s? And I'm not looking who's looking, who sees who answered quickly. I think it's here, right? So uh, the lady. Well, it was. It was over there. It was over yeah. there. It was yes. over there. Exactly. Yes. The answer is B. Uh, ra ransomware and sextortion. So, if you would look on pages 123 and 124, uh, you are now on our fact sheet for cybercrime, and there you will find the definitions of malware and bots and phishing and spamming. And I particularly like uh, clickjacking. I think that was one that Martin may have uh, <laughs> updated, which is the type of scam on social networks where we see a lot of that where they're trying to bait young people uh, to, to click there. And I think it's just about done for me. Oh, no, I'm going to. So there you go. That's just showing you the fact sheet number 18. And this is also to show another project of the Council of Europe because we mentioned sextortion. Um, if you were outside, you would have seen that there are uh, brochures um, on parenting in the digital age, which is for the online exploitation, um, against online exploitation of children, uh, for the online protection of children against sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. And these um, pamphlets are available in French and in English, and they, uh, we have some outside for you. Another question? What is the name of this little guy? Ah, that's interesting. No, nobody from the Council of Europe can answer. <laughs> no, you might have to. Nobody knows? Well, that's great. You're, you will find him in there, but uh, you won't find him referenced with a little picture. I will go ahead and tell you what. I'll give you one more chance. Somebody want to help a, a team to get some chocolate or prizes? No? Okay, you can go on your search engines. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> oh, you found it. Yes, thank you. You really want that prize. <laughs> so, the, yeah, exactly. This is Kiko um, and the Hand. Um, and because we were talking about sextortion and, um, and sexual abuse, um, this was another project and initiative by the Council of Europe, and it helps children three to seven understand that their bodies belong to them, um, and that there are good and bad secrets, and that there are good and bad touches. And um, you can see down below that there are videos, books, and posters, and you can see all of the different languages that Kiko the Hand is available in. Okay, it's over to Martin now. 
Okay, so I have data, especially the ones looking forward, but when I reread them, sometimes I feel like I'm looking backward. <laughs> That's how fast the internet is advancing, but so we'll go ahead with some of more technical um, questions. Um, this one is from the virtual reality um, fact sheet, and the question is, what does the term hikikomori refer to? Uh, oh, you already, we already have one. Well, wait a minute. Okay. There's another. Pro Gotta but, see the choices. But let's see the choices first. <laughs> Modern way of executing a harakiri, so suicide. Uh, the Japanese word for geek. Being withdrawn from social life or a fan, uh, a fan of a specific type of online anime. Well, I mean, you raised your hand first, so. Yes, exactly. So um, the, the reason that we put that there is because um, virtual environments are very specific. Um, they, they really immerse people in a way that they feel that they are in the virtual world. Um, and there is some, you know, some increased potential for withdrawing from social life or getting addicted for certain types of people. So that's why we wanted to stress basically, you know, that there are certain issues, certain new issues that, that emerge with uh, virtual spaces and that you need to be careful, but also recognizing all the potential there is for social interactions and, you know, so please check it out. Uh, next question. Oh, the oh there, that's, uh, that's the fact sheet 25. It's all the way at the back. Um, here's one about artificial intelligence. Where did the first hotel uh, fully managed by robots open? In which country? So can we see the propositions? Just roll them out, all of them. Yeah. So United States, Japan, South Korea, or Germany? Yeah. Japan. That's correct. So you were first. Good, good. Yeah, kind of obvious, I guess. Um, so yeah, again, artificial intelligence. I think uh, this one is also a very important chapter. Um, it's, it, it is kind of forward-looking, looking at all the potential that there is for you know, artificial intelligence, but all the ethical considerations on, across many different topics, be it self-reliance on you know, automated processes like self-driving cars, what happens if it breaks down, what happens about security, privacy, um, and, and even some more deeper philosophical questions, what happens in a world which is fully automated where you have nothing to do and you're just served by robots? Is that something that human beings will be glad about, satisfied about. I mean, it makes me think of Matrix when Agent Smith says, you know, to, to Neo, well, when we first created the Matrix, we created a paradise, you know, for humans. And they wouldn't have it. They were just refusing to believe that this was the real world. Um, and it's kind of along the same lines, you know, raising some real uh, uh, things to think about, about, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence uh, and the, the technologies that are waiting for us. So. Um, the last question, what does a hop refer to in the context of the Internet? Can you just roll out all the possibilities? An acronym for services online offering high online privacy, a term used by millennials when quickly checking an app, a short for hope used in certain memes, or the redirection of data between two s routers. Okay, that, the hand shot up right there. Yours first? Okay, sorry. Well, then, go ahead. Well, that's, uh, the, the it's D, indeed. So... This, this, is a, this, was a very, this is the first chapter, actually, so you might think, wow, this is very technical or whatever. But that is exactly the intention of this fact sheet, is to really go back from the basics. There's so many people right now that have no idea how the Internet actually does work. Um, and, you know, I mean, when you talk to children, they're just saying, well, I don't know, it's via satellites, it's via, you know. They don't even realize that, you know, your data gets chopped up into tiny little pieces and then it gets bounced around and it goes through your phone line to your ISP and then it goes bounced around between routers and then ends up in a data center and then whenever somebody wants to look at it, he has to go and connect to his email, which then goes to the data center. And I think it's absolutely essential to know this so that you can really represent yourself, okay, when I'm sending an email, where does my data go? Um, what happens to it? And what about when somebody consults my data? Does it get copied around? Uh, where does it end? Uh, who has influence over it? Um, I think these are, it's really essential for, for people to understand how the technology works in order to sort of build up on that knowledge and to behave more responsibly. So I hope you enjoyed that and please discover. Okay, so it's not yet over. You still have a couple more chances to win some 
Well, it wasn't cash, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, can you talk for me? So, there we go. I'm just showing you this picture, another treasure hunt, <coughs> to find this website. So, to give you the clue, it's what is the name of the first video on the Council of Europe's YouTube channel under the Children's Rights Playlist? There you go. Time's up. Time's up. Come on, come on, go quickly. hands kind of wavering in the air. Yes, you've got it. Sexualized images used in revenge, brackets, revenge porn. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Very fast. <laughs> I like this team. Um, obviously, one of the important things that I'm trying to show you here is that the Council of Europe has uh, a YouTube channel and there are lots of videos there for you, and they're available for you in different languages. Uh, for this, this was the, um, again, the project for the Lanzarote Convention, and uh, the, if you go on the Children's Rights Playlist, you will find 79 videos. Oh, can you go back one more? Okay, just wanted to show you one last thing, which is that um, all of the resources that we've mentioned, um, you can easily just go on the Council of Europe website. Um, you just look under children's rights, and then again, resources and publications, and you will find them all easily available for downloads, including the literacy, the Internet Literacy Handbook. Uh, we have a few paper copies now, but uh, you can download away at will, and we want you to really enjoy it. If you have any feedback, we would love to hear it. If there's things that are not included that will be done for the next version, I don't know what year that will be, please let us know. And I think now it's the time that everybody's waiting for. The Everybody is waiting for the gifts, but before the gifts, we'll end by the conclusions. So the Council of Europe, uh, it's an intergovernmental organization that thinks not just about politics, and uh, the measures and setting standards for the governments and law enforcement structures, but at the same time, it's promoting the literacy towards the internet and children's rights as well. So we had in front of us today a new version of internet literacy handbook that answer to the questions of the children, of the parents and teachers. It's a very useful tool and we are inviting you to use it and uh, uh, to ensure that we have internet safe uh, uh, promotion and w all of our rights are protected uh, by ourselves. At the same time, understanding where are our, our rights, where are our obligations, and how we should be responsible by using the internet. So I hope that uh, it was a useful discussions with all of you. And uh, the gifts are going to the most active uh, participants. But at the same time, I think it will go to every uh, table that we have, round of table that we have in front of us. So we are, you are enjoying uh, the end of uh, this day and of this flash session. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, thank you for thank you for being here. Uh, I know it's uh, somewhat late. Uh, I, I guess it's difficult to to get all the agenda for the day and uh, being at this time of day in another uh, session. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, we're going to discuss today um, how internet governance is uh, plays a role in terms of digital economy. So uh, for that, uh, we have uh, uh, three panelists now. There's one of them, uh, Virat Bhatia, who just uh, wrote uh, about an hour ago. Uh, he said that he's got the flu fever and he's pretty sick, so he, he cannot join us. But we have uh, Helani Galpaya, representing civil society. Uh, Verena Weber from the OECD, and also Paulo Inojosa from the technical community. So um, just to start, I'm going to try to uh, provide a framework uh, for our discussion. I hope that all of you participate with questions uh, afterwards. We have also some people connected uh, that are on the platform in WebEx, and we're going to see if the, they, can, they want to participate. So uh, I wanted to give a brief introduction about the topic of the panel, the, the roundtable that they wanted to propose here, which is the adoption of policies for digital transformation in line with internet governance and how both topics are related uh, and relevant to each other. So I'm going to start by explaining the current situation in Colombia, what we're doing, what we're trying to do, and to, to set the scene about uh, how developing countries uh, are trying to get to uh, define their own uh, digital transformation policies and how the implementation of those or the adoption of, of those policies could affect or not internet governance. Uh, so during the last seven years um, in Colombia we've had a pretty quick uh, development of uh, internet adoption. Um, we developed a very large fiber optics network, we connected the whole country um, and we have also worked in appropriation initiatives we have a, a lot of uh, new uses for the internet uh, and a lot of new people connected to the internet. So we're trying to move from uh, probably just using internet uh, for email and basic uh, uh, stuff to a little bit more productive uh, usage. Um, and after that, um, the CRC, the, I'm part of the regulator, the telecom regulator, we published a document in which we're trying to analyze um, or identify different actions and different um, initiatives that we would need to start uh, and develop uh, so that we can um, get the most out of the digitalization transformation in our country in different economic sectors. We call that the regulatory roadmap for the devel development of the digital economy in Colombia. Um, so there we're proposing a strategy to promote digital transformation for the country uh, and it's kind of a, a pioneering study in the region, Latin America. Uh, we have seen that there's, there's some difficulty in, in, in different countries, mostly developing countries, trying to define the best way in which we can um, get, take advantage of the digitalization processes in our country because we're not used to, uh, we don't have a specific uh, processes on innovation, uh, adoption of technology, so it, it kind of, uh, it's a little bit difficult for, for us. So as part of this work, um, we reviewed international landscape uh, of key regulatory and public policy uh, initiatives uh, across the globe uh, so that we could structure the, the pillars for the digital economy policy in Colombia. Uh, we reviewed different countries, including United Kingdom, Australia, Singapore, Chile, and the United States. Um, and we took from them all of the different uh, proposals, recommendations, initiatives, and actions that they have been implementing. Um, and we analyzed different economic sectors. We are a telecom regulator, but we analyzed uh, different sectors, including transportation, tourism, media, financial services, uh, postal services, uh, manufacturing, trying to understand how digitalization works in each one of those uh, specific uh, sectors. Um, so all of us, uh, I guess, in our own countries are trying to decide on how to better adjust to digitalization, how to better take advantage of um, the internet as a tool for social and economic development. So uh, we have been 
it's happening in Colombia. We have been decisions that have been taken by different uh, governmental institutions, by different, um, uh, I don't know, the judiciary, par parliament, uh, that probably are not in line with the uh, discussions that we have here at a venue such as IGF, so, uh, discussions related to internet governance. Uh, and there's, there's, we're th we were thinking that it would be good to discuss how we could uh, uh, inform those different stakeholders about the decisions and what is being discussed here in this, uh, in this forum so that we could have some, some uh, better decisions from their part. And I, I, I want to explain the, that with uh, in a, an example that we have. A decision that was taken a couple of months ago by the Con Constitutional Court in Colombia uh, they decided that uh, a specific content that was posted by, the, by a citizen needed to be eliminated from internet, from the website that it, it was posted on. Uh, the platform that, in which, uh, that supported the, the blog in which it was posted uh, had to register uh, as a telecom operator, even though they are not a telecom operator. Um, and the Ministry of ICTs uh, had to regulate the principles through which all platforms could block specific content uh, af affecting goodwill of or citizens or, or companies. So, if you see, um, if you think, ab if you think about this, uh, governmental institutions in charge of ICTs, um, we can be placed in uh, like a difficult situation, trying to work with other stakeholders like the judiciary, parliament, um, and also with other governmental instit institutions on the definition of best policies. Uh, so that we can migrate from the traditional economy, the analog economy, to a digital economy. Um, and also we have to balance these decisions with the protection of rights and the way in which internet work, works uh, like a, as an open and free venue for different market players. So based on, on this and the need to promote digital economy and the work that we or any other country uh, in the world has in terms of taking decisions on those policies that would uh, transform digitally their own economies. Um, I, I formulated, we formulated a set of questions that probably would be the guide for, for, the, for the discussion today. Um, the first one is if there's an impact on internet governance that might arise from the implementation of these national policies on digitalization. What kind of things could occur and have any of the uh, uh, attendees to the, to the to disable? have seen in, in different countries that could affect internet governance. And also, how could the internet governance framework support the adoption of better digitalization policies for our countries? If we can adopt or discuss things within our uh, internet governance um, discussions to better prepare our countries for uh, the adoption of those uh, digitalization policies. So uh, this is, that is the, the general framework. And I wanted to start with, uh, Helani, um, uh, I mentioned that she represents civil society. Uh, she works with the think, ta think tank that covers uh, Asia Pacific, South Asia Pacific. Uh, and I want to um, get your views on, on, on those, those couple of questions. And also, if you could uh, give us some um, examples or, or uh, cases that you've seen from different countries in, in the region that you cover, in which you could um, tell us about how uh, the discussion and what are the key issues that we need to consider in this adoption of policies and how internet governance could work and uh, be relevant in the, in the, on those discussions. Yeah, thanks, Juan Manuel. Um, so I think the, obviously the basic underpinning of a digital economy is the infrastructure, right? So if you look at India's emergence into the digital space as a major player in outsourced um, software development initially, well, call centers, very low value added into high value added, then outsourced software development, and then into software products and innovation, right? And that's a migration in terms of how much value you can capture as a country. The, one of the primary drivers way back sort of in the early 2000s was simple network redundancy on the international backhaul. And this sounds very mundane, but international companies who want cross-border sort of, you know, digital work and transfer of data 
look for redundancy. And there are so many countries in regions that we work in without redundancy in international backhaul. And obviously then you need good pricing. These are clearly within the control of the regulatory regime of a nation state. So I would say that's a very clear example of something in terms of policy that a government can do. Uh, in the case of Sri Lanka, which, um, so, you know, and India is at a state where 7% or more of its GDP is coming through the IT enabled sector. So this is not a small amount for a large country like uh, India and huge employment generation, so direct economic impact. Um, in Sri Lanka, again, it was initially a very government led process of um, identifying the fact that we had the largest per capita number of qualified chartered accountants in the world, and then developing a digital economy strategy where this particular niche market for outsourced account management and accounting work was developed through a multi-stakeholder process where private sector participated, well, not so much civil society, uh, and government worked this out. Let's go a little bit into the labor issues of a different type, so not the people who work in the big software companies, but digital mode for trade where the buyer and seller never meet and individual sellers and individual buyers work across borders to find each other and to strike up a transaction, to do the work and to transport the goods. I'm talking about online microwork and freelancing markets. Uh, this is not insignificant outside of, the, um, of America. India is the largest market for online freelancing. Even little Sri Lanka, with 24 million people, our national survey, surveys show that anywhere between 17,000 to 22,000 people work doing online freelancing and micro work. And this is a range of work. At the very low, quite exploitatively priced end, we are talking about one cent for ad clicking. Really awful work. At the middle end, we are talking five to ten dollars a gig to design logos, to write website content and paragraphs. And at the very high end, we're talking 300 to 700 dollars to do software development, right? This, the digital economy employment market would not work without good connectivity. But we hear other policy issues, which I think, for example, one of them is payments. So do the dominant payment on most of these work platforms is PayPal. But for example, Sri Lanka does not allow PayPal inward remittances because the know, they claim the know your customer requirements employed by PayPal are not good enough to meet the requirements in the country. I think there's also a lot of protectionism through the banks. This is a sector that has to be opened up. And I think there are ways to do that. And the consequence of not having these dominant platforms working across borders is that even though these people are earning really valuable US dollar income, which is really important for these small countries, they're not allowed to bring it into the country. Or if they want to, they need to use other methods which basically take away almost 50% of their earning in the middle management in, the, in terms of charges, compared to PayPal, which also keeps a cut, but significantly lower than other methods, right? So this is a non-digital policy that's really affecting the digital sector. And let me do my last thing about data. I think if the digital economy is to be really meaningful, it has to actually impact other non-digital sectors of a country. So we can't just focus on the digital economy, which is important. We need to worry about the ICT sector, the digitalized sector. But let's go beyond. How can the digital economy contribute? And I think one of the key ways is, to, is through data. Um, we have countries where sort of things like IoT, Internet of Things, and having sensors on buses and everywhere, you know, transporting, da giving data real time, these are sort of dreams that are going to come in the next decade for us, right? Uh, what we have in the form of a digital trace is the mobile phone signal that people generate when they walk around with a mobile phone. And there's multiple streams of data that come through that. The call detail records tell where you were if you were on an active internet session, SMS, or a call. And um, a visitor location registry tells where people were and doing what, even if you didn't have an active call, active session going on. Every time you move, every time you're anywhere. 
So this can be combined with whole lots of other administrative data like population data, for example, vegetation data, to do a whole lot of things in non-ICT sectors. And one thing we are doing is transport planning, working, um, sort of helping as outsider, the Colombo Megapolis Development Plan, which is the biggest development, infrastructure development project Sri Lanka has going at the moment, because they need to know where people live, where they come from, where do I put my multimodal transport hubs where people can come and park, get into a train, or come by train transport into a bus or an auto rickshaw. We need to understand how this happens real time. We need to understand where the traffic congestion hotspots are. You can do this with the cell phone signals because even poor people in our countries have cell phones. There's very high penetration of cell phones. In fact, they don't have credit cards, so we can't do good credit scoring, but we know where people move. So what we have done is to take historical and pseudonymized, so we don't know who these people are, uh, call detail records, these are trillions of records every week, from mobile phone operators, multiple mobile phone operators in Sri Lanka, for example, similarly in Bangladesh, et cetera, um, and, identify, and running sort of complicated algorithm with huge sort of hardware stacks to look at where people live, where they work, where they move to, what the population densities are in real time, not based on every 10 years of a census that comes out. Um, the second thing is it helps you identify poor people are when you combine sophisticated algorithms which include the reload patterns and sort of uh, where po and, and uh, Google nighttime lights and the call detail records. Where identifying where poor people live is really important in terms of service delivery. Even if you want to deliver eGov services, where do you put the kiosks? You need to really identify this, right? So this is connecting the digital and non-digital economy of identifying where poor people live. The third is disease. So Sri Lanka, again, just to stick to Sri Lanka, has endemic dengue. This is a malaria-like disease which kills thousands of people every year. Unfortunately, it's a new disease which is widely spread, and now it's endemic. <laughs> The biggest determinant of how this disease is spread is like malaria, is related to where people move and whether there are these particular types of mosquitoes. Where people move, the best indicator of that, again, is the cell phone digital trace that people leave as they're going about their daily business. So our predictive models have been as good in identifying where diseases will occur when we compare it to actually six months later where diseases did occur. So imagine if the government actually used our data six months in advance to prepare, because then the health inspectors can go and eliminate the mosquitoes. You don't stop the people from going, but you eliminate mosquitoes in these areas, right, which are predicted to have high disease. So this are just sort of an example of a way where the digital economy can directly contribute to the efficient functioning of other sectors of the economy. The biggest problems, again, are really internet governance issues here. One is data sharing. And privacy is a real, real concern, right? There's a lot of data out there that even we could use potentially that identifies individual people. Now, if I were not a pro public interest research institution, I could do amazing things with this and make money. So I take that data without the personally identifiable information. But there are no sort of easy mechanisms to actually get that data and remove that. And how do I share and what kind of legally binding contracts do I sign? What are the institutional mechanisms for data sharing are really, really tough. From the day we started negotiating with telecom operators, it was exactly 24 months until we got the first terabyte of data. This is a really long time. And you know we don't have the energy to go through this. This is in Sri Lanka. It took as long in Bangladesh. So we need to work out mechanisms where data can be shared. We need to know which data is dangerous and should be protected and not shared and how that should be shared versus a whole lot of data that can be shared, which is not being shared because people are afraid the privacy label is put on. But weather data, there's nothing private about weather data, right? But even that's not being shared. Um, I think second, what can you move in and out of countries in terms of, just for us, analyzing this data? The cheapest thing for me would be to put this on Amazon Web Services and use computational power that I can buy for very cheap to analyze this data. However, I'm prevented from laws, by law, from moving that outside, hosting that outside. So instead, in our little office, I have to buy air conditioners, backup generators, run a Hadoop cluster 
right? I now do this in Bangladesh. Now the Bangladesh data cannot come and reside in the server that I have in Sri Lanka. So now I'm replicating exactly that, paying enormous amounts of money to the few data scientists we can offer, transferring donor money to the hands of the airlines flying back and forth in order to analyze this data. And this is for public interest. The governments in these countries are using it. So cross-border data transfer, what's allowed and not, is another policy issue that is not solved. And I'll stop there. I, I just, just to add to that, uh, it sounds pretty interesting and, and very good question. Do um, you think that government uh, should have the priority in accessing that kind of information? Mobile operators could use the information to, I don't know, sell it or uh, mm -hmm. provide it to anyone else. Should governments have any priority on accessing that information just for, for social or, or that, that kind of purposes? Look, the not nice answer is government can get this data if they want to, right? I mean, we went through a civil war where people who were not preferred by the government were tracked using mobile network data and triangulation. Okay. So governments can always demand this data in a very privacy and human rights violating way. So that is not no, a question, that's, that's not a right? Way. However, to your broader point, is that yes, I think we need mechanisms. I have no problems with government getting this data. In fact, they should have a priority, but the problem in certainly the countries we work in is they don't have data scientists, they don't have the capacity to actually do anything useful with this data, and that's the bigger problem, which is why then you need academia and civil society to come into this and work on this data. Certainly long-term government capacity needs to be developed but I can tell you in the governments we work in, there are no data scientists, right? There are not even good statisticians. So this is really, really a hard thing, which is why sort of this, you know, multidisciplinary approaches okay. are needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Verena, um, I know that uh, OECD is working on a very comprehensive project, uh, which is called Going Digital. There was a discussion yesterday about that. And uh, uh, OECD uh, is trying to formulate a set of guidelines for countries to adopt policies on digital transformation. What have you seen uh, from that, those studies at OECD, are the key issues that countries need to address in order to get uh, to uh, foster digitalization in their own economies? And how can that affect internet governance uh, in their own countries? And, and to avoid getting to a situation in which uh, government accesses, has access to uh, information that uh, may be private and try to use it uh, inappropriately. Thank you, Juan Manuel. And as you mentioned, um, we're currently um, having a huge project at the OECD which is going digital. So why are we having this project? Because our member countries asked us um, how to go about um, the digitalization of the entire economy. So as some of you know, we have been coming to the IGF, um, I think since its beginning, and where we had like a, a focus on internet governance, and um, we, this is also something we applied within the OECD, so we put a multi-stakeholder approach from the IGF um, to the way we work. So at our table, we are having um, civil society, the private sector, the internet technical community, and the trade unions. So what we're trying to do with this project um, are um, three things. One is um, we're trying to understand what it means. What does it mean, the digitalization of the economy? Um, and what are the effects that this has on the um, economy as a whole and society? So um, for the first time, um, we're trying to work horizontally. So basically, the OECD is organized in different committees. So my committee, for instance, is the Committee for Digital Economy. And we're working with the Committee for Education, we're working with the Trade Committee, um, we are working with our colleagues on taxation um, to develop um, a holistic approach. So that means, um, on the one hand, um, we're asking ourselves um, what is happening in the different sectors. So um, we're looking at, for instance, digitalization in the energy sector, we're looking at driverless road transport and transportation, we're looking at tax challenges, we're looking at um, what does that mean for the future skills in demand? So we're doing this um, vertical work in all of the committees. Um, but then what we're also aiming to do is to provide um, policymakers the tools needed um, for a whole of government response. So basically, we, at this stage, we're trying internally, you know, how to make this work from an institutional perspective. 
and we try then um, to give government some propositions on how they could, could do this on a country level. So what would they need? What would be the institutional setting? What would need to change? And um, the third aim we're having with this project is to help overcome um, the gap between technology and policy. So this is it in a nutshell, I would say. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we also have uh, Pablo, uh, who represents the technical community. Uh, and I want to ask Pablo, what do you think um, in terms of uh, the model that has been used for the discussions of internet governance can be uh, utilized within the, any country in trying to define what are the best ways to promote digitalization and how could, uh, I guess, the, the venues in which uh, internet governance uh, discussions are taking place could serve as a starting point for the discussion with different stakeholders about these kind of policies and decisions that need to be taken by government, governments uh, so that they can uh, get to the, 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 like the best uh, out of the uh, needs and proposals from those stakeholders to build up a uh, digitalization policy that works for the country. Thank you kindly for the invitation to be here. It's all an honor and uh, it's a bit late, but uh, I'm happy to see a good group of people uh, attending these discussions. Um, my name is Pablo, I work for APNIC. It is the regional internet registry in Asia Pacific. Uh, we distribute IP addresses uh, in 56 economies all throughout. So we basically uh, attend a logical layer of the internet uh, even below the infrastructure layer. So when you talk about uh, sort of the digital economy and policies around that for digitalization, it goes well above uh, sort of the area of the work that we do um, in terms of servicing around 16,000 networks, mostly uh, internet service providers uh, with their IP addresses needs. So I was thinking really hard, sort of what can I contribute to this discussion? And indeed the question that you ask, um, uh, I find it uh, relevant and in a way I think we can contribute to that because the policies uh, for uh, allocating IP addresses uh, are um, uh, made uh, in a bottom-up uh, model. Um, they are uh, community-based and uh, they are, um, the, the network operators are the ones that decide how we, the registry, allocate those addresses back to them. And um, it's quite an interesting model. It's a it's a 25 uh, year old model, so it is uh, a proven model in a way. It precedes the ICANN model uh, as well, the, the one from the regional internet registries. And it is very much based uh, um, in, in the technical community. Um, later on, uh, after we started our operations, we took part and we were uh, very much involved in the uh, process of the World Summit on the Information Society, where actually the the principles for multi-stakeholder participation were somehow recognized uh, by the governments at a UN setting. And from there, obviously, comes the uh, IGF, the Internet Governance Forum, where we have also been active since, since, since inception. And obviously, um, sort of there is no one single characterization of uh, a multi-stakeholder model. And, the uh, prime example that has been uh, quoted multiple times is, is obviously ICANN. And ICANN was at the epicenter of the discussions during the, the, the WISIS time, uh, particularly because of uh, the role of uh, the uh, government of the United States in, in the IANA functions. So it is also kind of a strange uh, sort of circle of life uh, that very recently, just uh, last year, we concluded a process uh, in a multi-stakeholder setting to develop a plan uh, to um, 
uh, transfer the IANA functions mm -hmm. uh, from a government oversight to uh, an oversight by the multi-stakeholder uh, community. Uh, and I think that is a, a good example, and there are more examples. So the RIRs are one, the ICANN uh, policy development process is another, uh, the, the IANA transition process is another, there was the Net Mundial initiative, which was another, and, and more and more sort of these, these uh, sort of multi-stakeholder settings uh, are having a go uh, in uh, decision-making, uh, policy decision-making processes as well. Um, so my, my suggestion here would be that uh, uh, there is value of considering the views uh, from the technical community and from other stakeholder groups into the uh, decision-making process before you take decisions that ultimately will have an impact or will affect uh, the operations of the network at many different levels, not only at the higher level of um, uh, the digital economy or the applications or the uh, digitalization policies. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, with, with that uh, introduction to the topic by, by our speakers, is there any question from the audience, anything that you would like to ask? Uh, yes. Um, yes, I, uh, um, I have a question for, I think, each of the presenters here, uh, panelists. Uh, first, Verona, uh, yeah. so what's the vision that OECD draws in terms of the uh, digital economy, or even uh, the OECD is taking, I mean, considering uh, internet governance in their picture of digital economy? That's my first question. And another question for Pablo, Pablo is that, so is there, I, I don't know about this, but is there any gap between uh, the way in which uh, APNIC has been doing and uh, the request from private actors. So uh, I don't know, so the private actors are obviously uh, going ahead uh, or might be, might ask some new requests to, you know, for uh, APNIC uh, would reflect, should reflect. So, uh, you know, if there's any gap between um, you know, those uh, two uh, so traditional way of uh, doing, uh, uh, way of APNIC doing and the private actors new requests because of the technical development. And lastly, I have a question for uh, Helani as well. Um, so I, you know, you, you, you've been very well uh, talking and explaining the, the real realities, but I wonder uh, you know, if you could, you know, I, I would be glad to hear how these civil society actors are engaging with international organizations or intergovernmental organizations just such as OECD, like discussed. So you asked about the regional approach, right? The or just the vision of the OECD in terms of the vision. Of, yes. The, the vision. So, yeah. Um, so um, our vision is to one develop an integrated framework. So we're currently working with our country, um, with our member countries, to develop what is called a policy frame, uh, framework. And the current draft we're having is, okay, what are the key building blocks? So we start with access, and Helani mentioned it. I mean, that, that's a necessary condition, right, to make the digital economy work. And we are far from being there. Um, and this is also true for OECD countries. Um, then we, we have a block that is dealing with, okay, what needs to be done in terms of adoption? So the use, um, what kind of um, security and privacy framework do you need? Um, how will um, the way people work change? So that is like the second building block. We have a third block which is um, um, dealing with digital government. So how does, you know, the government um, needs um, to kind of reinvent itself for the digital economy and how should the strategy be done? And then this is our last layer um, is the strategy. So that's what we're doing um, across all member countries and in parallel um, we're, we're trying, we're testing this methodology, what it works, so we're having two pilot countries. Um, one of them is Sweden, the other one is Colombia, where we're currently undertaking a digitalization review where we're trying to apply this model and um, analyze the digitalization of the economy and the response of the institutions in those countries. Just, just one more thing, so I, I'm in Tay, uh, by the way, so, so in that, 
picture or in that vision, is there uh, some sort of an internet governance piece? So how OECD is trying to you know, uh, interact with uh, internet governance organizations or internet governance people? Um, I would say the internet governance piece is how we go about it. This is like how we work um, with other stakeholders. Um, so um, for, to develop this framework, we're working um, with the civil society, I mentioned technical community, the private sector. Um, so to, to have like a joint approach, so not only a government approach, but an approach um, that is um, kind of agreed by all the stakeholders. And then of course you'll see some bits of pieces that you see in the internet governance discussion that you also see in the discussion of the digitalization of the economy, and so, such as like um, how to um, improve access to the internet, um, how to guarantee privacy and security. So I would say you have quite um, some overlap in the both concepts. Okay. So if I understood your question right is uh, how sort of a multi-stakeholder approach differs from a strictly private sector-led decision-making process, right? And, and obviously, I think it is uh, an important question uh, that might have elements around efficiency uh, or expediency or how democratic uh, the decision-making process is or how inclusive it is. And in each of these parts, you need to balance out sort of how long it will take for um, multi-party uh, 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 um, discussions to agree on uh, an outcome and uh, how efficient that process can be, uh, how inclusive that process needs to be and, and, and what will be the algorithm to, to process sort of all these different views and what will be the uh, aggregation of interests uh, that will lead towards a, a satisfactory decision. That obviously in many cases is not uh, uh, efficient uh, if you would like to have a decision in, in a week's time. You know? uh, it, it, takes, it takes long and it takes a lot of energy. It's just like Bitcoin. You know? it, it, it consumes a lot of energy to process all of these. But on the other hand, there is the legitimacy of the outcome. Uh, there is the, the value uh, of, of the decision and how it will stand the test of time or it will stand uh, the, the, the test of implementation simply. Uh, because uh, having all these actors' uh, interest included in that decision-making process will probably make that decision uh, a better one. And I don't, I don't think there is a, a recipe or a model uh, which is just one single standardized one that will tell you this is the way that you should do it. I think um, uh, it depends a lot on also the culture of participation, also on the feasibility of participation. Sometimes you can have an open process, but then there are enormous barriers of, uh, or constraints to participate. Um, so um, I, I don't have a, a single answer, but I can just say that at least from the very sort of narrow technical scope of IP addressing policy decision making, um, we have had a, a, a model uh, for more than 25 years, which is participatory, private sector led, and community based. So if you think about sort of government engagement in international, with international organizations, I think there's a very mixed picture. So you will see, you know, I mean, obviously everyone wants to be in the rich people's club, which is OECD, right, the rich country club. So India will very enthusiastically engage. Um, I think when it's needed, you know, you will actually have the Indian sort of the diplomatic core engaging at other fora that are really important to internet governance, right? Like WIPO on intellectual property, on UNCTAD or WTO on trade and e-commerce issues. Uh, they will engage and in fact sort of they will very strongly engage and represent their um, uh, sort of interest. 
And even when you think about like sort of this current debate on where should internet governance rules be made, like the whole issue about enhanced cooperation, even that the Indian government is quite active. And I think that's partly possibly because there's national processes where civil society and everyone can give input into. So India, for example, the telecom regulator, I would say has really, really good consultation processes, not just about publishing things and asking for people, anyone, it's open to everybody giving input back into proposed legislations or if they're thinking about doing something. And then there's commentary about that from the regulator and in the final document they actually need to say why certain viewpoints were not taken into account. So it's quite a rich process for civil society and others to engage. But then Indian civil society doesn't just engage there, right? I mean, if you go to the big debates, for example, on enhanced cooperation and internet governance, Indian civil society is one of the strongest voices. They sit on the working group on enhanced cooperation, for example, right, civil society. They are quite strong. Now, the other countries in South Asia, I would say the best way of saying that is they have a very mixed record of engaging internationally, right? Um, and some of these are practical, as you said. It's not easy to come to these fora and actually get a speaking slot. Uh, and also it's related to not having the local engagement forum. So for example, how can civil society give input at the local level, which is then taken by the governments into international level. Those are less well defined in many countries and that's a problem in how you different sectors engage with these international debates. Thank you, Ilani. Any, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, actually, this question is from the lady uh, from the OECD. Actually, I was just curious, is there any regulatory challenge uh, for, uh, I mean, as a result of the digital economy? Because um, a large part of digital economy is about a shared economy, a kind of the shared economy, like a shared resources, a shared platform, the big platforms. So um, some people actually uh, mention about uh, like a regulatory challenge, for example, how to protect the individuals like insurance issues, or safety issues, this kind of issues. So because we observe it in China and other regions, you know. So would I, so I'm just curious, do you have any, you know, uh, have you encountered a similar issue in the OECD? Uh, the policy make, I mean, your plan, your vision. Yeah, thank you. The short answer there, loads. <laughs> so, um, and I would say on different levels. So a lot of our member countries are currently looking at how to improve their regulatory framework when it comes to access policy, right? Um, improving access to communication services. So we have some thinking of um, the notion of a level playing field. Um, if there is a need um, to deregulate, um, what else needs to be done in regulation? to facilitate um, access to new entrants and to foster competition. Um, so, so this is an area where I think our member countries have been working on for, for many, many years and where still work is to be done. We also see some new developments. For instance, we're seeing um, the first um, wireless wholesale access network in Mexico um, among all OECD countries. So Mexico is currently um, going ahead with this project. So this is a purely wholesale um, access model um, where um, the company that is building this network cannot sell to, to end consumers. Um, so this is very interesting and we're following this model and um, we think that, um, so we will need to see what this means um, in terms of further accommodating regulation. Um, then you mentioned platforms. Um, so we are currently having a study that is looking at platforms. So if you wait for another couple of months, we'll have some first results there. And then as I mentioned, we have a lot of other areas in the OECD that are working um, on the question what digitalization means in, in terms of um, adapting, I would say, um, the legal and regulatory framework. So we have colleagues in transportation um, looking at um, what it means to have um, driverless and automated cars. Um, we have colleagues um, in our um, tech center that are looking at, at you know, how do you, do you need to modify 
um, the way you know the, the tax regime is done. Um, we have colleagues um, in the skills area that look at you know what should governments need to do um, to make sure you know that people um, are prepared for the digital economy. So these are some examples. Uh, uh, just to add to that, uh, I work for the for the regulator, telecom regulator in Colombia. So what we found out uh, from all of these uh, discussions inside of our country is that uh, as a telecom regulator, we tend to disappear. Uh, and the thing is, uh, you should not regulate internet, so uh, your regulatory functions would disappear in time. Everything is moving towards uh, internet, so you would tend to not have to regulate. So we're trying to move towards a uh, regime in which we deregulate or work with the different stakeholders and market players so that they can propose the, the way in which uh, regulation should be imposed, probably based on principles and uh, like basic uh, rules that don't generate additional obligations to market players. And another thing related to platforms is that uh, we, in the telecom industry, uh, we have different companies, uh, uh, video streaming services that compete with uh, uh, traditional TV subscription, that we need to analyze those kind of situations and, and how do they become new market players. So we've done uh, uh, like two or three different demand studies in the, last, in the last couple of years, trying to identify how much um, uh, one of these platforms is a substitute to the traditional services. And based on that, based on the situation that we've, what we've seen from, from the industry, we've got to a point in which uh, we know that we cannot regulate. We, as you said, we probably need to level the playing field and try to deregulate the traditional market players so that they can adjust to the, to the new environment. And we're trying to generate, in the study that I mentioned at the beginning, a methodolo methodological guide for other regulators uh, that, for example, transportation regulator in Colombia has taken a decision on uh, not allowing platforms to provide transportation services. So uh, it happens in uh, many of our countries. So we're trying to recommend those other regulators from other economic sectors to change their view on how digital actors get involved in the, in the market and how to change the, the way in which you, for example, analyze uh, market definition uh, so that you, you adjust for the presence of digital market players and you get them into the, the whole uh, value chain of your industry. So uh, I guess it, uh, there are a lot of challenges, as Verena said. Uh, uh, I guess none of us has the, the exact answer, and uh, there are things to be done. <laughs> there are a lot of things to be done. Any other question from the audience? Can I? Can I? Claudio Lucena, Paraíba State University in Brazil, FCT Portugal. Uh, I know it's not a specific panel on, on jobs, but you, you're projecting internet governance in times of digital economy. And Verena just mentioned that part of the work is checking out if people are ready for this digital economy, and it touches jobs too. So, uh, have you? Uh, are you thinking of moving forward in analyzing? the impact of this digital economy in, in jobs and alternatives if they are not as much as a digital economy will need? Uh, okay, so um, that's not my area of expertise, so that's my colleague's area of, of expertise, but um, I can give you my card and have a look at our website because um, they recently published a report on computers and the future of skill demands where they're addressing those kind of issues. So I can point you to that publication and you'll find more information there. So this is one work stream. The other work stream is we have our colleagues from education. Um, they are testing both the digital skills of students in schools. Um, and they also, and, and this is, um, so that, that's more recent than the other one. The other one is in the context of PISA. Um, they are also testing the digital skills of adults and we really have an issue in the OECD and we have a huge gap and when it comes to different age groups, et cetera. So this would be another work stream the OECD is working on. Paulo Tavares, I'm from Brazil, uh, Recife. Uh, it's from uh, OCD. 
what is the focus of the OECD discussions when analyzing the taxation of digital economy business? Um, so again, um, we just prepared uh, a nice report on this, um, which is called Addressing the Tax Challenges of the Digital Economy. So I can give you more information um, in my card after the meeting, and I can share the report with you. Anyone else? Uh, any question? Okay, now, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Julian Casas Buenas. I'm from Colombia, and I work for um, um, a non for profit organization in the use, uh, strategic uses of Internet. And I'm wondering if uh, in this analysis of uh, digital economy, it's also taking into consideration uh, not only uh, the economic factor, but when applying uh, um, digital projects that uh, reaches the grassroots communities. And um, uh, for instance, in appropriation of technology, we have seen in some analysis in Colombia that for one peso that is invested, um, the local economies can um, uh, enter in a dynamic where uh, they can uh, produce uh, three pesos for each peso invested. Is this um, analysis included in all this uh, digital economy at all, or is just uh, based on economic uh, um, issues? No. Don't know if it's clear. If, if he's asking if, if there's um, uh, if in the discussion about digitalization, uh, how uh, investment from the government, for example, can uh, generate a uh, like social development, social development, multiplicative, multiplicative effect. Effect, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a look? Do you have studies yeah. looking at this? No, I mean. Um, I haven't done modeling on this, but clearly this is um, a huge part of the equation in developing country governments, invest in digital anything, right? So in the case of India, the multiplicative effects of the investment made in the infrastructure are really clear. That's 7% of GDP, right? And in fact, that was with very little government investment because that was a lot of private sector provision. So it was actually a good model. Right? Um, I think the, the sort of the business case is harder now when you get to rural areas where the population may be less dense. In the infrastructure case, the private sector is not willing to go, and then the private sector may not in the short term reap the benefits of investing in infrastructure because, you know, if somebody, you know, it's not the same part of the private sector that benefits. So the business case for what that multiplicative effect is very clear for a government, less so for a private sector when you're pushing the boundaries, for example, in connectivity, right? Okay. Okay, uh, I guess if there's any additional question. Okay, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna do a very brief, uh, like, uh, uh, review of the things that we discussed today. We talked about uh, good connectivity we need good connectivity to connect people so that uh, we can uh, country digitize in some way. Um, um, Helani talked about the need to provide avenues for uh, s different ways of payment so that you can promote, I don't know, e-commerce transactions. Um, uh, not in, mostly in countries, developing countries where we don't have as much uh, people that use uh, financial services like formally. Um, and also a very important point that you raised about data and how data could be used by governments to provide uh, some uh, information and taking decisions regarding, for example, uh, disease control and, and things like that. So that we could use that, that data, obviously with some issues that need to be dealt with um, regarding data sharing, housing of that data. Uh, that is one of the discussions, most important discussions about where do you uh, host the data if it's in your country or other countries? Mm -hmm. And what are the rules applying to do, that, those data that you have from your citizens? Uh, Verena talked about uh, the importance of having a holistic approach to uh, digital economy and how governments should have 
uh, that holistic approach in terms of the, the way in which they, uh, they promote digitalization, digital transformation in, in their own uh, economies and, and every economic sector. And uh, I guess one, uh, the last point, very important made by Paolo about uh, how to use uh, the discussion model uh, used uh, in internet governance to promote participation of different stakeholder groups in the decision-making process about these policies regarding uh, digital transformation and how we, how we can get to better solutions probably. Uh, pro, uh, sometimes with a lot more work uh, for that discussion process, but probably better decisions at the end in terms of policies. So uh, I don't know if you have anything else to, to conclude, uh, but I guess uh, uh, that's uh, like a very brief uh, uh, resume of, of, the, of the things that we have discussed. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for your participation. Thank you very much. Sure. You know what, the, the payments, um, we, did, we have a study on e-commerce.